Here's, here's a, a, a note from my previous employer. Here's the last 10 years of my uh, utility bills. It's like, right, on you get. Um, here's my anime preferences. I swear oh, I've watched Sword Art Online. I'm, I swear. I don't know what that show is about. <laughs> Bro, how? I've how can you not know it. by now? It's, I swear. I know the gist, but I've never seen it. It's the template. Everything else copies it. You must. You basically see it through copies osmosis. copies that awful <laughs> show. <laughs> You have seen it. You just that seem to show is this. garbage. I've never seen it. It is true, but you've seen it. No, I haven't. I Andy, please continue. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Lore Crimes. Today we are covering the bestest, bluest boys, the Ultramarines, brought to us Ooh. by the great Andy and Colin. But first, we have a reading of our question of the week. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Eli. So this week, because it is an Ultramarine-themed episode, we would like to ask you all to comment below the video what is your ultramarine theoretical and practical? So to give you an example, Law Crimes is a very serious discussion platform talking about law. Practical first thing we ever said on the channel was necrosy. So and we stand that, behind it. And we stand behind it. Or, or official a, statement. Another one if you'd like to use uh theoretical I've never seen the Godfather <laughs> practical, I think it insists upon itself. You've uh, never seen yeah. anything, bro. We argued about this yeah. already. <laughs> One out of three Lord of the Rings films. Oh. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hasn't seen Sword Art Online watches anime perpetually. Hell, hell was loose <laughs> with the barrage. Oh, gosh, man. Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you so much as well for answering the question of the week uh, the previous week. And we've chosen three of our... We'll say I've chosen... Three of my favorites, and I'm gonna read out to you my victims. Um, so this is a the good first. One. This is a, this is a definitely. Um, I think you'll enjoy this quite a lot. So the first one was from Tristan Wood, and he's put hashtag hot take. Perturabo really upset me. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. It's too silly. No. I didn't even it's hear what you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too silly. Control yourself, Hal. We read the first <laughs> question and he's already incapacitated. Thanks, everyone. We can't continue this is to be emotional. Okay. Can't stop giggling. <laughs> God damn. Um, Perturabo really upset me when he said it's Iron Warrior time and it <laughs> Iron War and Iron Warrior all over the entire Oh time. my God. <laughs> oh my God. I iron without than within. Uh, I love the Iron Cage. When he, when he ironed all over Dorn. <laughs> Ironed all over the setting. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, ooh, big breast, big breast. Okay, number two is by uh, Rick. <laughs> oh my god! You <laughs> get through the name this time. Oh gosh! <laughs> I'm so sorry. The guy's name is Rick Pregnant. <laughs> I don't know why that made me actually lose it. Oh, I'm not holding it together at all. <laughs> okay, hashtag hot take. Fulgrim was, and in brackets, still is, the worst Primark, even before he picked up the layer blade. Oh, man, Eli, uh, he's, he's called you out. How are you going to say so, that when Perturabo and Magnus exist? Uh, sorry, the, the name just tripped me up. Uh, Rick Pregnas. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, so sorry, Eli. <laughs> and the last one, oh, we're bringing it back down, boys, by uh, Liam O'Rourke. He put, hashtag hot take, Fulgrim's Primark ability is to be the biggest simp in the universe. <laughs> he simped after the <laughs> Emperor, and now simps after Slanesh. I don't Damn, know, Lorgar was more just, of an Emperor simp, to be fair. People were just going at, at it, man. <laughs> <laughs> why, sorry, do people, man. why don't people like Fulgrim? He's a good I don't prim know. He's a good Primark. Maybe he iron warred over the entire <laughs> setting. <laughs> oh, 
Oh man, so sorry for that. But thank you so much for your answers. I enjoyed them too much. There, <laughs> I got too emotional, uh, and I'll hand over to Andy to take it away in our beginner section. Take it away, Andy. Right. Thanks very much, Hal. Uh, so today we are talking about the poster boys of the franchise, the uh, the most popular of all the Space Marine factions, at least in the eyes of Games Workshop. I'm not sure exactly if that's true for the, the average consumer for, you know, the models, but the Ultramarines, the 13th Legion, uh, they were during the times of the uh, both the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, and pretty much after the, the Horus Heresy, the most numerically superior Legion, and as a result, had the most successor chapters. They are, there's a lot of them. Um, you could call them the uh, the Boy Scout Legion uh, and chapter. They're very, you know, uh, to the point. They get things done. They're all, we're good and honorable and, you know, we give lollipops to children. Not in the Salamanders way, but, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty consistently doing the most heroic stuff in the modding setting. But to start off, um, they consist of the Ultramarines are basically conscripted from the 500 worlds of Ultramar. So Ultramarines come from the the single biggest faction homeworld area, shall we say. So we know that, for example, Rogel Dawn of the Imperial Fists had an empire before the uh, Emperor found him. Rebute Gilliman's was bigger, so he had more planets and he could get more people involved. Now, Rebute Gilliman is the Primarch of the Ultramarines, very, you know, stoic and honourable and a nice chap, and his... His children follow in his footsteps. Uh, like their Primarch, brilliant tacticians. They're very good at adapting to you know any failures they incur. They're very regimented and disciplined, much unlike the World Eaters. They're basically the complete opposite. They're very you know formal battle lines. They know exactly how they're going to go into battle. They're going to do it to the letter. And if they mess up, they're going to take account of that. Um, as a result of... Their Primarch's influence, they're also not just great warriors, but also good administrators and statesmen. As a result, the Ultramarine's homeworld and its surrounding planets are actually some of the most nice places to live in the Imperium. They're very loyal to the Emperor, they've never faltered once during their service to the Imperium. Uh, they have a lot of incredible deeds under their belt from all the way since the Unification Wars up to Era Indomitus. They're pretty much, at least during the, the Great Crusade, the only legion that had more plaudits than the Ultramarines was the Sons of Horus, and that was only because that was before their inevitable downfall and betrayal of the Imperium. Um, they didn't fight as much as some of the other legions, technically, during the Horus Heresy, because Horus, as the War Master, specifically tried to keep them out of the engagement, because there's so many of them. He's like, if, if the Ultramarines bring their might to bear... We're done. We're not going to win this war because there's there's too many and they're too good at what they do. Um, even if they are basically a jack of all trades and master of not many. Um, following the Horus Heresy, like I said a little bit earlier, when they were broken down from the size of a legion, all the legions of the Adeptus Astartes had successor chapters, and because the Ultramarines there were so many, they have tons of successor chapters. You know, Nova Marines. The I think it's the um, the spear, uh, spears of the Emperor. Genesis chapter, oh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. They've got like 50 chapter successes or something crazy. There's loads of them. I believe, um, yeah, it was 50% uh, of all chapters, at least officially, are descended from Gilliman's gene seed. So Jesus there's a, there's a lot of Smurfs in the galaxy. Descended from the big blue balls themselves. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, oh, Lord. And and as a result, their, their influence is pretty much the most widespread throughout all the Space Marine chapters because they're the gold standard. Uh, even before Horus Heresy, they were the, we, uh, like I said a little bit, they were among the, the two main legions that everyone was going, they're the cool ones that we need to follow the example of. Uh, not the Dark Angels, because, you know, even though they were first, no one liked them. Um, Hot take there. <laughs> I like that little pause of how to go, Ooh. Ooh. wait for all the hate in the comments. Should have had a more um, outgoing Primark. 
Yeah, not the friendliest of Primarchs. And, and that's the thing, you know, they're, they're actually very friendly uh, as a legion in, in regards to, you know, they treat civilians well. They're not like the Salamanders who, like, treat them well, then set them on fire occasionally. It's like, no, no, they're, they're pretty pretty good at, like, public relations. They've this got a great a, HR department. This is a certified Eldar child moment. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. So, yeah, they only, meme... they only Sorry, like him yeah. after an extensive background check, though. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like anyone... Um, I think it was, like, the Lion... I read it in the, the Lion's Primark book recently, that the, anyone, like, literally every single human on his ship, he knows. And it's like, oh, mm. that's pretty, pretty mental. And the lion's like, have you done your enhanced DBS check before you get on the invincible reason? They're like, yeah, here it is in triplicate and laminated. And uh, here's, here's a, a, a note from my previous employer. Here's the last 10 years of my uh, utility bills. And it's like, all right, on you get. Um, here's my anime preferences. I swear oh, I've watched Sword Art Online. I'm I never, swear. I don't know what that show is about. <laughs> Bro, how? How, how can you not know it. by now? I, I know the gist, but I've never seen it. It's the template. Everything else copies it. You must. You basically see it through copies osmosis. That awful oh, show. You have seen it. You just that seen through osmosis. Show is garbage. I've never seen it. It is, it is true, but you've yeah. seen it. No, I haven't. I it. Andy, please continue. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, so I'm nearly done. It's nearly time for Colin to take how we're over overstimulated. Ignore. Um, yeah, and yeah, mainly how. Um, True. <laughs> so basically, to cut a long story short, uh, in the current setting, with the return of the only loyalist Primarch to still be active in the set of setting, Rebute Gilliman, the Ultramarines are once again put at the forefront and are the most favored of all the chapters and that's why they're the poster boys they, they've got the most they've got the got the biggest draw because they're the ones who are the most active at the moment um they're the spear tip of the imperium's war effort and you know they've got some of the coolest tools you know not, not only have they got a primarch they're one of the only chapters who has a gloriana class flagship the mccrag's honor which is basically one of only uh, like the black templars have one uh the imperial fists have a bigger ship but that's the only one i can think of like they've got the biggest ship they've got the biggest baddest you know war leader who's now in charge of pretty much everything and they get the best guns the best armor the best tools to get the job done they get the most books they get the most models they're ultramarines they're everyone loves to hate how popular they are um and with that very scatterbrained yeah i think succinct intro uh, I suppose it's time to pass the reins over to Colin, who will have a much more measured way of explaining things. Uh, yes. Of course. Measured. I, uh, That's what we're thinking. I, <laughs> I do, uh, do want to ask, does anyone have any uh, questions before we go to the expert section? Preferably questions that are not about my preference in anime or TV shows. <laughs> oh, damn. Let me, just shoot that, <laughs> let me just get that one down before we go on. Would you say um, that... Uh, Gilliman is kind of like Nerevar, and <laughs> uh, Horus is kind of like uh, Dagoth Ur, and he's and Horus needs to drive out the Mongol dogs of the Empire and honor the sixth house of the tribes that are unmourned. I'm just putting this in there now because someone needs to understand that reference. <laughs> so, someone, so someone's been listening to a lot of Dagoth Ur AI generated. Videos. I have sent you. I have sent you five. I think consecutively, and I just can't get it out of my head. It's Ugh. very appropriate for the for the mongrel dogs of the empire we're about to learn about. <laughs> All right, let's not insult the marines. The ultras. True, true. They are, they are they are cool. They are mm. cool. Ugh. I have no questions <laughs> other than that statement. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> Eli. Uh, not yet. All right. No. Well, then let's get into it. I would uh, I would like to say before we start, this is uh, there is a lot of. There is a lot of ultramarine lore. They are, like yeah. we've said, they're the poster boys of the franchise. Like, Space Marines are already the face of Warhammer 40k. And the ultramarines are the face of the Space Marines. So there's a lot of ultramarines lore. And if we were to cover every single thing in it, we would be here for two weeks. So this is uh, more of an overview of the ultramarines as a whole rather than specifically Gilliman or any of the characters within it. I will talk about that and we'll bring some of the very important ones up. 
But mm. just as a just as a heads up, this will be kind of beginner to expert on the ultramarines, as it were, not on a ultramarine. So yeah, and we good. might in the future be doing a specific ultramarine character if they're important enough in the future. Indeed. Uh, so with that out of the out of the way, allow me to tell you about the greatest of them all, the ultramarines. So mm-hmm. they were the thirteenth Legion of Space Marines, as Andy said. And, of course, the great Rebute Gilliman is their Primarch. If you ever have time, just look up a list of all of Gilliman's nicknames. They are very funny. Uh, oh, they are. Half as many as Nagash, but still a lot. Yeah. <laughs> or was it the power of Nagash? There's no, there's no version of that. For there is no Gilliman. For, for Gilliman or 40k, which is a shame because that quote is amazing. The power of taxes. That's what Gilliman's is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ro- Robo. Power. Robo girly girly man is still my fate. It's the good old classic, but it's still my favorite. Robot guilty spark is my favorite. Uh, but <laughs> to avoid <laughs> drowning, oh, yeah. drowning the episode out in Gilliman's nicknames. In the comments below, <clears throat> if you're listening, you're, you're, any Gilliman nicknames, the funnier the better. Indeed, <laughs> please do. Uh, as for the Ultramarines, though, they are at least I would wager maybe the closest thing in 40k that we have to a modern military. In terms of, they don't strictly prioritize suicidally charging into a gun line for the glory of you know corn or the emperor or whatever. They're all about strategic planning, tactical planning, as well as the minimalization of casualties and material losses. So much- say maybe the the Raven Guard kind of do that more, but they're more like uh, the SAS or like the Marines kind of sneaky stuff. And- yeah. The Ultramarines are better at just like, oh, if, if shit hits the fan, we're going to go in and we're going to be better probably at the actual fighting up close and personal. Yeah, like the, uh, I say if I had to put it, the Ultramarines are more of equivalent to, you know, like the, the army or the Marines, as it were. And the Raven Guard are like the, like Addy said, the SAS, the Navy SEALs. As a the Raven Guard are 100%. Has anyone done a playthrough of Skyrim when you get the Ebony Mail? So you're just, you're in yeah. heaven. You're in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> In heavy plate, but you're all stealth. That's what the Raven Guard are. <laughs> that's that's about right. <laughs> uh, additionally, to that little bit of how they fight, which we'll develop on later, they're very reminiscent of the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks, that Greco-Roman culture. Uh, Macrag is essentially ancient Rome and Greece in outer space. And the units such as their honor guard show that they have no small amount of Roman influence amongst themselves. What's the name of the part where Gilliman was entombed? Is it the, the something of Hera? The um, you know you know what I'm talking about. It's like the little oh. like the marbled area. It literally is the most Greco-Roman thing you can ever think of. A it's fort- like Fortress it's like, of Hera. Fortress of Hera. Yeah, I wonder where they got that from. <laughs> Essentially, oh, Hera. Where'd that name come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, Out of the bag entirely. They Not- are. No copyright. Very Greco-Roman. Uh, highly organized and efficient in battle, they make it a point to plan for as many outcomes as they possibly can before it begins, because that ensures they have a plan for everything, and they don't need to think on their feet. It's just, this has happened, I'm going to do this in response, and everything will go well. And fair enough, when this works for them, they're pretty much unstoppable, because since they plan so obsessively, they... It's almost like foresight in a way, not through magic, just through them thinking so hard about what could happen. The flip side of that is, much like the Romans, if an unforeseen variable occurs or their plans go awry or someone just knows enough about their tactics and what they're going to do, they can outfoot and outsmart the Ultramarines pretty easily. Uh, I had Tetoburg Forest for the Romans, where one of the Oof. Germans, I believe, trained to be a Roman soldier, so he knew just how to fight them. And the Tyranids and the Tau for the Ultramarines. Uh, mm. I will cover some of that later. But while the if things are going well for them, they're going very well for the Marines. But if you wrong foot them, you're going to hit the Smurfs very hard. That being said, this only happens once. Because after the initial victory, they're going to look at what happened. And they're going to ensure that it does not happen again. Because now that they mm. know that X scenario is something that can happen. They're going to put it into their plans, into their rule books, and they're going to make sure that you can't do it twice. And they might yeah, even use it. Reminds it reminds me of, 
it reminds me of the uh, the time again. Corvus Corax, Primarch of the Raven Guard, had like a kind of simulated battle with Rabute, and he won. But then after that, he never won again because it was like Gellerman was so good at going. Oh, I see what you did. Try now, hmm? Yeah. And his sons are exactly the same. Like I believe it was like someone was like Corax said, "I could win a battle, sure, but I can never win the war after like the first three times or something like that." Mm. It's like they uh, you can't wrong foot them more than once. So, let's begin their history. So, they Ultramarines, be- they Ultramarines, jeez. The Ultramarines began, as all the legions do, in the gene lads of the Emperor to form his armies. Uh, initially, they were informally known as the Warborn, as most of the recruits came from people that were nearly wiped out by the Emperor's armies before they joined the Imperium, which I thought was neat, and it also kind of explains why they're not called Ultramarines, because they didn't find Ultramar yet. I didn't actually actually know that. That's quite cool. Yeah, did I. uh... It's actually very similar to the word bearers, interestingly. Like, both of those legions were comprised of, we beat you, now you join us. It's like, oh. And it's an interesting parallel. The Romans did that too, didn't they, as well? Uh, How interesting. Yeah, the Romans were very happy for uh, whoever was left after the fact for them to join them. (laughs) <laughs> which wasn't many people. The uh, the Romans were certainly good at that. To get back to the Ultramarines, the gene seed of them, as, well, all space marines have gene seed that they come from, very stable. Uh, there was no problems in terms of mutations with it, to the point that, as we brought up earlier, that's why about 50% of all chapters in the modern Imperium come from the Ultramarines. They're just that well put together at the core level. Uh, it does, however, for some reason, make the person, they make the recipient, they become like fa- I don't, I could think of no better way to put it than what I wrote down. They're big fans of cohesion and hierarchy. Like they become attracted to those concepts in a way. Like the chain of command becomes something almost sacred to them. For example, like disciplines in the DNA, kind of. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the perfect way to put it. Discipline is the DNA. Uh, furthering that little Roman influence all about the ranked formations and whatnot. And it ensures they have, you know, they're even better at following whatever plan they come up with to the letter. Uh, I prefer to think of it as it turns them into power bottoms, but maybe that's just me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. That's the the kind of statement coming from someone who hasn't seen The Godfather. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's oh, happening. You what did I say? It uh, insists upon itself. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyways. Moving on. Uh, there is no evidence of them actually being deployed on Terra, all this being said. The first records instead have them fighting on the moon and a conflict known as the Sedna Campaign at the edge of the solar system. So unlike many of the other space marine legions that would become chapters, they weren't really doing much on Terra other than just recruiting and becoming what they would eventually be. And over time, the Legion would, much in the same way it was initially formed, further bolster its strength by recruiting from conquered worlds. So as the Warborn went across the uh, the galaxy, bringing more worlds into the Imperial Fold, they'd conquer you, and then whoever was left, you got an invitation to join the Space Marine Club. Uh, much like we were saying, the Romans, uh, you're going to get a very violent frat house. Uh, yeah, very. Uh, <laughs> they stayed at they stayed at home for ages and did nothing, and then they went out and was like, <laughs> "Come on, chug, 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 chug." Now you can be an ultramarine. Well, that's how it works. Yep. Are they still considered quite disciplined at this time, or is that generally unknown? Like their temperament before uh, it Gilliman? was. Actually, I was going to say the gene seed. They were known as disciplined. Uh, what it would the way it would work is it was these weird mixes like a lot of the gene seed uh, qualities in other legions it makes itself known pretty quickly like uh, you know if you're a space wolf you might randomly turn into a furry uh, Oof. good luck I good no but like make a little jab at the space wolf I, I, I needed to do it <laughs> uh, well, all right to be fair if I I've, if you want me to punch the other side of the fence if you're a thousand Oof. sun you might turn into like living sludge from ghostbusters <laughs> Um, that slime dust, under New excuse York. me. Dust, <laughs> was, dust, dust was is later. my pronoun. D- dust was later. First, it was Ghostbusters slime. 
<laughs> Barry's well, just like, hope you don't have any allergies. <sighs> ah, I've got a cold now. Well, they used to, well, the flesh change is, to be fair, if you're new to Warhammer, it's the Legion's um, gene seed floor of the 13th. No, not 13th Legion. Excuse me. This is the 13th Legion, 15th Legion. And you would literally like balloon up inside your armor and like turn into like a mutated muling thing. Chaos spawn. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. So, it's a picture of that. It's disgusting. The Ultramarines gene seed. You know, noticeable traits, much less obvious than that. They, uh, they'd become, they would be known for their aggression, which is why so many of the recruits came from conquered worlds because they would show up and put you in the dirt. But it was mixed with restraint and discipline. So, this also, funnily enough, made them excellent for partner campaigns with other legions because the Ultramarines, I'm just, I'm Warborn, but Ultramarines is what they're going to be called soon. Very good at working with others. They're very disciplined. They're able to follow a plan, so another legion might form the plan, and the Ultramarines would execute it to the letter. Uh, usually... Can I mention something very briefly about their anatomy as well? Of course. Um, that ties in quite well to what you just said. There's there's an excerpt I've got here from the, the book Legacies of Betrayal from the Horus Heresy, and it's about an ultramarine that um, he teams up with a guardsman sort of character to, to take out the enemy. And there's just this bit here that says, you know, um, he's basically been wounded and he kind of, his body shuts down briefly to recover. It says, um, he's under mind and body, making the necessary repairs for him to function again. Ultramarines are particularly good at this recovery. They do it efficiently, rapidly, better than any other legions. It is one of the reasons they are so hard to kill. So I thought that was like a little... They they literally are so disciplined. Even their recovery process <laughs> is more efficient than anyone else. Damn, this truly is expert. I did awesome. not know that. Neither did I. This, is, yeah. this is actually new to First, me. I this is pretty to good. heal the leg and then the chest wound and then the, the blood yeah. supply. <laughs> They're literally having a conversation. Then he's like, feel? And he's like, ugh. And he's just like shut down for a moment because his body's gone like, okay, heart, check. Arms, check. Okay, he needs a bolter. Make sure his muscles are... It's like, crazy. They are disciplined to the core, absolutely. Uh, and through all this, pardon me, they became known as a very practical legion. They uh, Early on, though, a defeat against rebels that were assisted by unknown Xenos, which I want to say this is another case of the Great Crusade, Horus Heresy, where they introduced the coolest sounding Xenos race ever, and then just they just get wiped out. Uh, mm. they would be, uh, become known as the Assyrian or Osirian Cybrids, and they said they show Ooh. up in these, like, hourglass clockwork ships that, mm. uh, and they're incredibly psychic, and it, there's not much about it, but it was a very cool read when I was going through it, and these rebels combined with the Xenos do defeat the Ultramarines, and for a little bit, they uh, they go on a bit of a darker path. They become filled with shame oh. and almost bloodthirsty, and they refuse any and all glories until they're reunited with their Primarch because they figured that that's how we're going to unshame ourselves. We're going to find Gilliman. Uh, so <laughs> Daddy, I did a shame. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> uh, they need a... Uh, so if you, it's basically, if you would go to offer them a handshake, go, mission well done. They'd uh, they'd blast the Lincoln Park and go no I don't deserve this honor. <laughs> oh, what I've done? Uh, no, Evanescence, <laughs> wake me up. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. wake me up inside. Wake me up inside. That was that was the Ultramarines Legion for a uh, for a Save few years. Me. Uh, also, oh, God. Uh, speaking of Gilliman, moving on to him and the rest of the Great Crusade. Of note is that. They'd actually found him two years before this rebellion and problem with the Xenos. Uh, but due to warp storms, they just couldn't reach him. Uh, so have any of you seen the movie Interstellar? Oh, yeah. The, you know yeah. the, the bit where he's... He's seen like, that he got, one. He hasn't I, seen The Godfather, but he's seen Interstellar. I, I, Ugh. Brother. <laughs> uh, this is the theme oh, of the episode. Hasn't, hasn't <laughs> seen Two Towers, hasn't seen Return of the King. I've have read Harry the books. Uh, the first you one. You've watched the first Harry Potter. Yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't care for it. Right, yeah, it's, it's right. the worst yeah. one. Bro, he's not yeah, seen Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah, I've, I've read the books. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't count. 
It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> all right, oh, okay. rubbish. It's fine. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, horse hairs doesn't count. Anyways, uh, Gilliman. Right. Couldn't find him for two years. Uh, as I was saying, like the Interstellar scene before my taste in movies was brought up again. Definitely, was, you're uh, not you're not buying <laughs> Hogwarts Legacy. No, are you? I will not <laughs> be doing that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but with the interstellar comparison, I'm going to get this out if it kills me. It was like the guy, when the guy was banging on the bookshelf, like at his past self, They're like, no, don't leave. Oh like, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. That was kind of the image I thought of when I saw, read they found Gilliman, but couldn't reach him because of the warp stones. <laughs> they were like, he's right there. Come on. I don't know. I was, I was just like, imagining the emperor just like a cup of tea, just like put the kettle on. Waking up, it's like, has it, has it moved? Has the warp storm moved? It no, sir. Okay. At least, Able tennis it is. At least we know he's there. All right. Mm. Uh, but as with all of the Primarchs, once Gilliman was reunited with the Emperor, he was given command of his legion, who then became known as the Ultramarines. Which, as a little side note, that's perhaps best translated as People of Ultramar. Rather than specifically, these are the ultra marines. These are the best marines ever. The super bestest. It's more like super, super bestest special boys. <laughs> like the this is going to oh, sound wow. weird to put it, but a good way to say it instead of ultra marines might technically be ultra marines because the emphasis uh, would probably be in like yeah, the, the, like ultra marines. Yeah, yeah, because they're from ultramar. But that being said no one's going to call them anything but the ultramarines so did they get named after the color ultramarine i as of the writers i don't know but now that you bring that up i saw a i just a, there was a marker laying on my kitchen table and i looked at the color and it was ultramarine and that was not the color of their armor Fine. so oof I don't think they're named after the color, because if they are, they're named after a lie. They are not Ultramarine Blue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just loving the idea of like a Games Workshop employee creating the Ultramarines, and he's like a little bit colorblind. And he goes, that looks like Ultramarine to me. And then it's like, oh, no, what have I done? It's like, no, that's a Whoops. deep blue. That's ocean blue. It's yellow. <laughs> oh, that's green. Actual, actual heresy. Literal heresy. Oh. Uh, but anyway, with that being said, where I just qualified as ultramarine doesn't mean they're the best, they then <laughs> proceeded to have the highest amount of planets among all of the legions brought back into the Imperial Fold. By a mile. Yeah, it was uh, like just well ahead of the other ones. Now, that being said, many others had more military victories than the ultramarines did, but at least as far as I'm concerned, and I will let my favoritism shine through a bit, this is shows that the Ultramarines, they're willing to think, they're willing to talk. They, uh, in a setting called Warhammer, the Ultramarines figured out, if I speak to them, we can use our Warhammers on our common foe and not each other, as it were. <laughs> uh, so between that, Gilliman's logistical skills and everything else, they were the forefront of the Great Crusade in many ways. Uh, with Gilman leading the helm, they even got vengeance on those Osirian Cybrids I mentioned earlier, where Gilman personally killed their leader while his battle chief battle psyker fought alongside him and sacrificed himself so they could battle could be won. Oh. Which is, again, one of those bits of lore where I wish the Xenos were more uh, developed upon rather than being used as plot development for the Ultramarines. They have to make a. I'm so desperate them. Yeah, desperate for them to make a another faction where it's just the, the collection of like the minor Xenos, like the Crud, the Cray, like, like the Tower, the Covenant, mm. like the Tower supposed to be before it became Mecca. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, it'd be so cool because, like you said, there's so many. There's so many of them that are like yeah, they're, they're better than the actual Xenos we have. I think there used to All be right, troop well. units and stuff for tabletop, even yeah. like extra crude things and characters. Oh well, such is such is the pain of being a Xenos player in a Space Marines game. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, but uh, to get back to said Space Marines, their record was not squ squeaky clean. They uh, they got up to some stuff every now and then. For instance, a lot of the planets that they brought into, while they did have the highest amount of peaceful compliances, 
weren't strictly speaking brought up in any ways but as a tax base. So while some places were made ideal, uh, you know, places to live with the, in the new Imperium, the Ultramarines would always make sure that at the very least there was a planetary defense force and taxes were able to come in. Other places, that was all they got. So sometimes the Ultramarines turned into a new Macrog, which is a, you know, a nice Greco-Roman, not quite paradise, but certainly better than most places. Other times, for example, Nuceria, uh, they might not even know Gilliman's name, uh, such as like the state they left it. They would go, right, the taxes are coming Oof. in, the, uh, the planet has a defense force so we can leave and it won't fall apart in five minutes. We're done here. Now, if I could posit a bit of a theory for that, I personally think that's because the Emperor wanted the Great Crusade to go at a certain tempo, and Gilman was not allowed time to properly bring all of these planets up to speed. That there is said, a uh, there's a theory. Sorry if I interject here, but there's like a slight theory about that, which is obviously we're in expert section, so we can we can say, but um, the Emperor supposedly, if you are new to Warhammer, the Emperor figure the emperor master of mankind he can see the future some of the primarchs can not gilliman unfortunately but he could see i was like so many futures that it was almost too many futures to see but him and malkador supposedly saw a future in which they could achieve their golden era of mankind and they basically needed to like get it done real that's why the great crusade is so it happens like over 200 years, doesn't it? It's quite relatively quick over in terms of conquering the galaxy because they they saw like a future and if they took too long, if they didn't do it fast enough, essentially that golden era would slip through it's their like hands. It's like a sweet spot. Yeah, like we've got to get it exactly in and this it, margin. It, and if we're too late, we won't get, we'll get the bronze. We don't want bronze. We want gold. We want you know? gold. And it did slip through their hands. Yeah. Spoilers. And to be fair to what you were saying about the compliances, like the word bearers got chastised because they took too bloody long. So they'd conquer mm. a planet and they spend ages. And, and also not in the nice way that the ultramarines like, oh, we're going to give you like a governing body and yes, taxes and stuff. But like word bearers, have you heard of our, of our Lord and Savior, the Emperor of Mankind? No. Get the get the lash, get the whip, get the stretcher. <laughs> oh, you, you're going to you're going to behave now. Uh. Yeah. So. And though, like I said, that was at least partially my theory, uh, my answer for why Gilliman left some places in not the best state, uh, he could have just not cared at all. Uh, I just like Gilliman, so I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt between that and some... He does have more of a humanity than the others anyway, so it would make sense. He's yeah. nice. He's a nice yeah. guy. He's, you know, as far as the Primarchs go, yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. But we'll talk more about him in a later episode. For now, we're uh, not quite done with the Ultramarine scandals. For the two lost Primarchs, uh, when they were dealt with, it is very likely that most of their troops became Ultramarines after the fact. Uh, oh, I heard about this, not, yeah. Not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as it were. Uh, they figure that the Primarchs are far gone, but the legions can still be saved. So they were mind wiped and given to the Imperial Fist and Ultramarines. This is uh, also a theory, but this isn't, like I was saying with Gilliman, a theory I came up with to be nice. This is one of those theories that is in the books and is soft confirmed, not fully. I believe the uh, exact passages, they're talking about it and... One of the characters denies it, but he does make note of the Ultramarines having an increase of troops around the same time as the Legions were gotten rid of. Mm. It's like with most of the missing Primarchs lore, it's like there's just heavy hints, but it's yeah. never... I don't think they'll ever confirm it, to be honest. No. Because they want us to be like, you know, and just essentially, obviously the opportunity to make your own uh, design, your own Legions, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a big old you know ha ha point over there big sign that yeah. says ultramarines I, are yeah pretty it's, big. it's one of those things like it's not officially confirmed but there's a lot pointing to that the ultramarines might be one of the biggest legions because they got a bit of a hand in that 
<laughs> I will say and, as well, and it would make sense because they've got the most planets to reinforce. Like, oh, if they lost them, they'll, they'll replenish them. Whereas they gave it to another legion, then oh, we gave you like sixty thousand Astartes. Oh, we we can't we can't replenish those numbers. No, I don't want excuses. Get it done. You know. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do have a theory that it is the survivors of those uh, lost legions. So the, again, it wouldn't be like. They wouldn't dump a hundred thousand marines and be like, yeah. And then no one mentioned, by the way, that half of these people are from a different legion. I always speculate that it was a survivors of what Russ did, shall we say, mm -hmm. Russ the executioner. <laughs> I liked it. I like to think it was 1984, and it's like these have always been your brothers. We've <laughs> we have always had these extra hundred thousand marines, and then they shout at a TV with a minute, a minute of hate <laughs> denying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, how dare you, scum! Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, but these these controversies aside, the the biggest uh, uh oh, shall we say, came from we were talking about Lorgar earlier. Funny enough. When they burned down his capital city, Monarchia, this, you can, you know, we were talking about Lorgar should have picked up the pace earlier. Uh, perhaps this was not the right way to handle it. Mm-hmm. So what happened was the Emperor was not a fan of Lorgar teaching everyone that he's a god. And he was also not a fan of Lorgar taking his sweet time conquering planets across the Imperium. So, Biggie went to Gilliman and said, I need you and your legion, and we are going to take care of this problem. And Gilliman accepted this without any hesitation, and the Custodes, the Emperor of Mankind, Gilliman and the Ultramarines, descended on Lorgar's world of Kerr. To and the Malkador. Oh, and, pardon me, and Malkador. I, I forgot there was so many super soldiers around, I, I just couldn't see him beneath all of them. Mark the wizened old man next yeah. to the old, giant golden boys. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, old, the old man you can earn. Uh... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eli. Uh, no, I was done. I was just saying he had a cool moment in that he lives getting battered by Lorgar and he's fine afterwards, even though he's he a billion like years old. And then he runs at the same pace as Valdor. That's always been in my <laughs> mind, that moment. I'm just imagining an old man just, like, booking it faster Keeping than a mortal man. Pace <laughs> with this demigod. <laughs> like, like, yo, you know look that, that scene, man, um, go. In the first um, Star Wars film, well, oh, here comes a law crime. Uh, you know that bit in um, The Phantom Menace where Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are in that corridor and they just, like, dash. Oh, <laughs> they just vanish. And they never do it again. You've seen the Phantom Menace, right? stand off. Yeah, yeah, Yes, I've seen the... Oh, my God. I've seen Star Wars. <laughs> oh, my God. I was, I, was, I was a kid when those were coming out. Yes, I've been taken to a movie theater in my life. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, God, I can't wait for the... Sorry, the most obscure movie. Now. Come on. The most Move obscure on. movie on the planet. You haven't seen the mashed potatoes and bangers and mashed film? Blade Runner? <laughs> All right, oh I'd like to move gosh, on. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Okay, yeah. Uh, Monarchia. Uh, Monarchia. Drive? Monarchia. Okay, okay. So they burn, they pretty much burned down the city. To give the Ultramarines a little bit of credit, uh, they did evacuate anyone who took them up on the offer to get them out of the burning city. That being said, if you did not take them up on the offer, you burned with the city. <laughs> Uh, there's some more Roman influence to you. They'll offer you some mercy once, and then if you don't accept that mercy, you are becoming one with the dirt. Uh, and they made the Emperor forced Lorgar and his legion to kneel before him, Malkador, the Custodes, the Ultramarines, Hull Shebang, and... When you say Neil, we don't mean like, oh, do it, I told you to. Like, he physically used psychic powers to, like, crunch them down so they couldn't move. Yeah, it, it was like, you are going to get on your knees and bow. That always confused me, that moment, that he forces, like, essentially 100,000 space marines and a primarch to kneel, and then he tells them, I'm not a god. Like yeah, but I think yeah. the thing is as well. Like <laughs> his, his, his point was mainly going, why can't you be more like Gilliman? There's a reason I brought him. Look at your brother. He's like he's got a job. He's he's got like boy in the child. month. He's look at him. Look at look at look at these guys. Look, look at his jawline. Cool. Yeah, look I at his jawline. Nice what are you red doing? And you tight. shaved your head. You look you look silly. Be be more like your brother. That's basically what it was. Uh, that that being said though, hell yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> It's like that you, was confusing. You, me you forced, the, like a twelve foot tall super soldier, 
and his thousands of eight foot tall super soldier sons to kneel before you at once with space magic while you're walking around with your glowing golden halo and fiery <laughs> and sword. Armor. Yeah. It's like, oh, I wonder what people are going to think. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> back to the Ultramarines. Um, Gilliman privately confided with many in his legion that he was close with, his officers and whatnot, that he he doesn't regret following the Emperor's orders, but he feels guilty about what he had to do, and he worries that he pretty much permanently damaged uh, his and Lorgar's relationship as well as the two legions, and oh, how right he was about that. Uh, yeah. Because now it is time for the Horus Heresy. Uh, because after this, the Great Crusade kind of continues as normal for the Ultramarines. They just, you know, bring more worlds into compliance, get them, get the tax base going, rinse and repeat. And then the Horus Heresy happens. And when it first happens, you know, the legions are all spread out across the galaxy. They're uh, they're not just in a, you know, cell phone distance where they can't give them a call and go, hey, Horus is a traitor. Uh, so Gilliman doesn't know what's going on at first. And indeed, Horus suggests that, well, requests that he and Lorgar embark on a mutual campaign against some orcs. And in Gilliman's eyes, because, you know, he doesn't know that Horus has done the traitor thing yet, he's like, oh, this is just a simple military operation, we'll kill some orcs. And in fact, he even thinks, wow, this is, you know, this is the perfect time to start, you know, get relations be- repaired yeah, back. Clean slate. Yeah, it's yeah. like, hey, water under the bridge. We're friends. It's fine. It's like, you know what? You know what makes space marines bond more than anything? Killing orcs. So come, Lorgar. Yeah, so they're equivalent of fishing. Oh uh, yeah, let's go kill some orcs. <laughs> uh, at least that was, you know, in Gilliman's mind, what was going to happen. Uh, and instead, on the planet of Kalth, instead of some nice, wholesome, family-friendly orc genocide. The word bearers opened fire on the Ultramarines, who had no idea what was happening, and I believe it was a third of the entire Ultramarines Legion was killed on the Battle of Kalth. So That's how you deal with the Mongol dogs of the Empire. (laughs) This is how you honor the sixth house and the tribes of the Unknown. You got the line in. Yes, I, got I, I do like the um. Is it? The, I think it's from No No Fear where that starts off, where it's just the the uh, word bearer and Ultramarine who are friends. He's like, "We get on well, don't we?" And the Ultramarine's like, "Yes, we do. I'm glad our legions are now friends again." And he's like, <laughs> "Well, it is a good thing we are friends because of what happened. Yes, it would be a shame if there was a betrayal." <laughs> yes, <laughs> hmm. I'm glad we are friends. And you're like, and then it's like stab. And you're like. You made it quite obvious. Come on. <laughs> it's just that meme of the, has it always been like that? And then it's the person behind going, always has been. And oh, then... <laughs> the astronaut meme. <laughs> yeah. Is it that meme? Where it's like, wait, Ooh. this has been a betrayal? Always has been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you plan to kill us at Kelth? Always have been. Yeah. Damn. Oh, and, but, and to uh... be fair, the word bearers were already pretty deep into heresy. Like they, they were, they were, they were, they were corrupted from the start. It was going to happen someday. Yeah, if I remember correctly from my Gilliman video, plug, plug, uh, I believe it was 40 years later this happened, so the word yeah, bearers had they, about... they stewed on it for 40 yeah, years. Yes, they, they had some time to think about what the Ultramarines did. And Lorgar had already them. fallen, and he was, like, plotting, like, when can I get get my revenge? Oh, Horus, that'll do. Fine. Oh, Joe, Horus wants to be a traitor? Perfect, let's kill some Ultra. I mean the Emperor. <laughs> uh, so... Despite this, they, they did give as good as they got. Uh, the word bearers were eventually repulsed, and they, they by all accounts, fought them off very valiantly, the Ultramarines. Yeah, they took out half their entire fleet. Yeah, they uh, let it be known that if you give the Ultramarines any time to breathe, you have lost the battle. Uh, and there's, of course, the... Uh, I know it's I know it's a book cover, but that wonderful artwork of Gilliman without a helmet in space. Yeah, I think punching, that's no no fear. Yeah, punching a word bearer's brain off. That is, <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, <laughs> Gilliman in the vacuum of space without a helmet. <laughs> yeah, Gil- Gilliman was Gilliman was just done playing Doom earlier that day, and he was putting what he learned into practice. <laughs> uh, but that being said, just because the word bearers are driven off does not mean things are going to be good for the Ultramarines. They uh they rally around McCrag to kind of you know catch the catch themselves 
and then the word bearers uh, left after Kalth, as well as the uh, world eaters, which word bearers, world eaters. I don't know why just saying those close together seems kind of weird, but. No, I've had the same problem. Probably don't worry. Yeah, it, they get the, easily mixed up. The were and the, like, the E-A-R is E-A-T. It's too close. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, they uh, they begin the sh- The were E's and the were E's. Yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they start the Shadow Crusade across Ultramar and pretty much just do what they were doing to keep Gilliman out of the war. Like we were saying earlier, even with Kalth, there were still too many Ultramarines because yeah. if they Horus got Horus did not want them involved. Like, of all the legions, everyone gets a scrap at Horus apart from the Ultramarines. Yeah, it was like, it was like with Kalth, it was like, oh good, we brought them down from four times as many Marines as we have to only three times as many Marines as we have. These it's odds... A- what two legions literally took two legions to fight them yeah and Insane. they had to summon a ruin storm to trap them and be like you're not escaping here like yeah. stay put they are uh, the but you're locked in here with me <laughs> <laughs> uh so the ultramarines uh yeah they're stuck around ultramar uh and then conrad kerr shows up on ultramar just why not throw more primarchs at Gilman? <laughs> don't let him breathe uh, and then Lorgar does a does a cool little magic dance, and then cuts off the entirety of Ultramar from the rest of the Imperium, the Ruin Storm. And acting on the assumption that the uh, the Ultramarines a little sidetrack, they were very big on theoreticals and practicals. So theoretical, here's the overview of the situation. Practical, here's how I'm going to solve it. Gilliman said, "I do not know." if the Imperium is still out there. And I cannot access it, I cannot leave my Empire, McCrag, I cannot call anyone. I need to act on the assumption that it's just fallen and this is all that's left of my father's dream. So, they form the Imperium Secundus, with the Ultramarines obviously taking uh, charge of it. And it's briefly like a, a little island of stability. I mean, as much as it can be with Angron, Lorgar, and Conrad Kurz running merry hell across the system. <laughs> uh, but, you know, compared to Terra at the time, at least, things were going things were going all right. Uh, eventually, Sanguinius and the Lion show up, and Gilliman realizes that Imperium's still out there, they're still fighting, and this has all been a massive waste of time, solely to keep him away from Terra. And when he learns that, in case anyone was going to call him a traitor for the Imperium Secundus, let it be known, he canceled the whole thing immediately, and him, his ultramarines, and the Dark Angels held off the traitor fleet surrounding them in the Ruin Storm to allow Sanguinius to get to Terra, and the rest is history that we will cover at a later juncture. Uh, as it is ultramarine time. Uh, but the ultramarines did, once the Blood Angels made it through, gun it towards Terra, but by that time the siege was already over. Yeah, one of the reasons that the Emperor and Horus had to have a fight to f- to finish the war because the Emperor was like, all right, this siege is getting a bit protect- protracted, and Horus was going, the the Ultramarines are coming, they're coming, oh, we've got to finish this, because uh, if, if they get here, we're screwed. So they were both like, we need to finish this now. Yeah. That's why I had to come down to a duel, because both were under a time constraint. Yeah, the Emperor was like, I have about three minutes of food left for my army, and Horus was sitting there knowing... The Dark Angels and the Ultramarines are, oh, they're on their way now, are they? That's great. <laughs> the two oh biggest God. armies remaining. Oh, no. Good, good. The, the legions that have pretty much done nothing but have time to gather their strength are on their way. <laughs> Phenomenal. A slight side note, very briefly, is, has anyone seen the fan-made, um, the, the fan version of the Horus Heresy, but it's Gilliman instead? That gets corrupted. So oh, the, the... kind of, I think. I've heard... kind, kind of like the Dornian Heresy. You might have heard that one, but someone made mm-hmm. one a fan story about Gilliman being the, the like the Horus figure. I've heard corrupted. of it, but I'm not nearly as familiar with it as I am with like the oh, it's, the regular it's so cool Heresy that... or the Dornian one. It made a very cool. Uh, ch- there's a cool piece of artwork if you look it up, like corrupted Gilliman, and it's it's one of those ones you go. Oh yeah, like Gilliman being corrupted is actually really terrifying, considering 
again how many ultramarines there were and <laughs> i think the scariest thing is just how many taxes he's going to make they're really unfair no, like, I was kidding. You know, tax <laughs> so even, how many guns does your battleship have that's an extra tithe how <laughs> much shoe polish do you use that's just like, like, like a, a window so tax <laughs> a window tax oh, what could go wrong with the window tax e evil gilliman says i hate taxes i'm just banding the irs <laughs> <laughs> Oof, that's that's how you know he's truly far gone. If you want to survive, eat your children. Wow, he's really taken a turn, hasn't he? Yep. <laughs> oh, he, he he go he goes from Caesar to Caligula. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, rough. Glad he has no sisters. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, 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 moving on, moving, moving on. on. Anyways, post heresy. Uh, they participated, of course, in the scouring. You know, driving the remaining traitors after. Horus was control deleted uh, into the Eye of Terror. And once that was over, they also decided, you know, we should probably help out our fellow Astartes, and they saved the Imperial Fists from certain destruction after Rogaldorn decided that the best way to make up for his dad dying was to headbutt Perturabos to death. Uh, st stellar... St Stellar stuff there, Rogel. And he iron warriored over the yeah, entire yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, <laughs> oh, no. and then Perturabo iron warriored all over Rogel Dorn at the iron. It's page. iron warrioring time. <laughs> <laughs> From iron come strength. Like, calm down, Patty. Oh, bro. Okay, that uh, imagery. Okay. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Uh, yeah, really love that bit of lore. Oh, how. <sighs> Rogel Dorn's like, how, how can I keep us together as a legion? I know. If I kill most of my legion, there won't be enough imperial fists to form new <laughs> chapters with. <laughs> then we'll stay I together feel, forever. I they're gonna they're gonna change that surely. I think because it was written by. I, I hope they. Was do. it written by Matt Ward? Funny enough, related to Ultramarines. Uh, I don't or, know. It, no, not Matt I Ward. I don't think it was. Although the ending might have been when the Ultramarines show up to save the Imperial Fists. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, the Imperial Fists don't have the best track record of like keeping themselves from getting extinct. If I'm honest. Oof. Oh yeah, the uh, War of the Beast coming up. Yeah. Uh, but to to keep this, I, I I do like the fist to keep this from just dunking on them for the rest of the episode. <sighs> uh, after this happens, Gilman pens the Codex Astartes, and has the legions divide into chapters. Now, something of note is what I feel like feel like is worthwhile mentioning is that the le chapters were already something within the legions. It was just more so like this is like an organizational unit. So it's kind of like, you know, in an army you'll have like a squad, a, you know, a battalion, a platoon just going up. It's uh, chapters were essentially that for the legions. And now it was just uh, take those chapters and that's the group of space marines. They're not part of a grand legion. They're just their chapter now. And naturally the ultramarines, given that their primarch did this, accepted this without complaint. And split across the galaxy into all the hundreds and hundreds of successor chapters that now form up from the Ultramarine Gene Seed. So, you know, at least Gilliman didn't have to listen to any back talk from his sons when he penned the Codex Astartes. He had that much going for him. They already love all his previous works. They're like, no. sign it, please. Like, please, I'm a big please. fan. Another one, please. More books. <laughs> Step on me. No. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. No, the the Ultramarines are the ones that don't have daddy issues in the setting. Calm down. <laughs> true, true. It's the other legions that are fatherless. I was gonna say, isn't it quite crazy? They went from like two hundred and fifty thousand Ultramarines to essentially a thousand. And that still blows my mind. Thinking it's a very wow. exclusive club. Yeah, that's like say. they must have a lot of equipment left over. They uh sure. they. Do and I feel like now is a good time to mention, uh, Andy. You remember that Genesis chapter you brought up earlier? Yeah. They uh, they are pretty much an entire chapter of spares for the Ultramarines. Yep. <laughs> they uh, so like say the Ultramarines, they're down. Like, hey, we uh, this guy died in a battle. We need a new librarian or a tech marine. They'll just grab a Genesis chapter librarian or tech marine, and he's now an Ultramarine. Yeah, like, you've been promoted. Well done. Yeah, it's like you are now an ultramarine, and they even correct any codex deviations the Genesis chapter has, so they will be nice and perfect ultramarines. So if you ever wondered, man, the ultramarines sure seem to get into a lot of crap and come out without any losses, they do have losses. They just pilfer the marines of another chapter. To be fair, there's some really cool, like, some of the first founding ones, like, there's, like, the size of the emperor. Like, they, they tended to promote... 
chapter master a lot of people in the horus heresy who did like a particularly good deed like the size of the emperor it was the guy who defended the sofa device and like uh i can't remember exactly what happened with like the nova marines but like and uh there's another one um i feel like it's the raptors but it's not the raptors but there's another one they have like silverish gray doom armor eagles? And... Do oh yeah was doom eagles so, that's yeah. the one yeah they have like a lot of interesting ones where it's like oh who's the chapter master and it's like they did a cool thing and they helped save gilliman and you're like oh fair enough yeah cool yeah, put your best guys on the job. Yeah. Do we, uh, do we all have a favorite Ultramarine successor chapter? I gotta be honest. Fears of the Emperor. <laughs> I think it's the Genesis chapter because it's just so <laughs> funny to me. <laughs> but it's like their their bargain brand Ultramarines. <laughs> Discount Ultramarines. I don't know. What's we the one have where Ultramarines at home? <laughs> this is the Genesis <laughs> chapter. What's the one that like they worship the dead? They're like green armor. Mortifactors? Mortifactors, yeah. It's something like that. It's something close to that. It was like the Mort... That is one. Mort something. Mortifactors had like a... Are also, yeah. I think that's Raven Guard. Yeah. They, yeah, the Mortifactors have like a, like a skull as their sigil on a black background with like green trim. People. Yeah, and they eat people. They're quite fun. And they keep like, the ashes of the dead, don't they? And they, they spread yeah. it. They yeah, there's a weird amount of superstition weird. in the Ultramarine successors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I like the I, howling griffins. Oh yeah. Oh, they're cool. Their yeah, gene flaw is just cool. hating the word bears. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a flaw. That's a, that's a, that's a, oh, that's a perk. <laughs> just they become um, absolute to find the word bears. Silver skulls. Are silver skulls. Yep. Ultramarine silver skulls. skulls. Ultramarine. If, loads. If, They've uh, almost died. So like many I times. said, fifty percent of all chapters in the Imperium are from the Ultramarines. Yeah, Flip a if coin you at, like, if the you wiki name a chapter. Oh, so firewalls! Firewalls! Fire fire oh yeah, fire they are. If you look at the Legion of the Damned, I, I like just looking at like the wiki page for Ultramarines and the whole page. If you like go like the whole left side of the page or right side of the page is just chapter, 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 chapter. Mm -hmm. There's like sixty. Jeez, is the were the Astral Knights? Ultramarines? Where? Astral Claws, I, think I mean, in... sorry, not Knights, the Astral oh, Claws. Yes, one with Luft Huron, he became yeah. Luron, Huron Blackheart, sorry. Oof, mm -hmm. big L. That's the whole, that's the whole reason he Very justified his, uh, him expanding, <laughs> expanding, I think, you know, in big and, le letters there. And uh, the, uh, not, not quite the same thing, but, uh, Hon Su from the Iron Warriors has, uh, Ultramarine Gene Seed in him, doesn't he? Mm, no, he, he's half, he he's half, half Iron Fist. Yeah, half Iron Warrior, half Imperial Fist, but he, he, he battles Ultramarine for some reason. How do you he, have something? I think he's a he half battles Uriel Ventress, doesn't he? Yeah, so that's... technically Ultramarine, that's the Ultramarine part there. But no, because um, Fabius uh, Bile made him. That's why he's, um... Fabius Bile's experimenting. It's in the, oh, it's in one of the Emperor's Children books. I think it's hmm. Angel Exterminatus, the very yeah, end. Yeah, I'm going to read that one soon. It's so... So and that's the... I guess that's the downside of having so many members of like the, the ultramarines like the traitors just occasionally are like i was a good ultramarine i wonder what became of my gene seed oh that guy's using it oh he's a word there <laughs> they must have the Yuck. most stolen gene seed by far yeah exactly well it's it's, it's... oh sorry what's so be like well, I was going to ask you if it was the purest. Is that is that correct? I uh, that's I believe that is the reason that so many chapters use their gene seed. There's of course the initial boost. It was like there's just so many ultramarines after the heresy. They're going to make up a lot, but they're frequently chosen to have their gene seed used for future foundings because it's so stable. Like the closest thing they have to a flaw is they become more organized, and they're like that's if that's your gene seed flaw compared to. You know the black rage. I think it's pretty simple. Who's gonna go with who? True. Um, also, this—that's as you can probably tell. Any anyone listening? That's why I said this uh, beginner to expert might be more overall ultramarines as a whole because the moment you start diving into specifics, they have so much going for them in terms of lore. I mean, what we just... I Kato Zakarius. I K oh, I'm getting to him, Hal. Don't you worry. <laughs> oh yeah. So we just, oh yeah. We just spent a good what five minutes just talking, about naming successor chapters. <laughs> true. Yeah. True. They've, uh, there's a lot of ultramarine to go around. So to get back to the uh, the main chapter, not just the bargain 
Park at Ben Ultramarine. Genesis are getting <laughs> really bad today. I, 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 I wanted to be known. sucks. It's rubbish. I love them. They're awesome. It's just, it's just that <laughs> if I talked about nothing but, you know, the badass Space Marine chapter, I'd be here all day. There's Space Marines. They're I just like awesome. how like, people are like, is that a Blood Angel? Oh, no, it's a Genesis. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, there's worst. one guy listening to this who has his entire army of Genesis <laughs> chapter, and he's, he's just got... Tier. And he, no, no, he's, he's like not crying yet, but his tears are missed. His eyes are missed. <laughs> oh. Oh, he's like, like screw you law crimes well, you know, you know like mortar factors are cool because they eat people and he's like why well <laughs> you know what one genesis guy you you keep rocking on with your with your yes please <laughs> comment bargain. below if that was you and Ooh. if you're upset bargain brand smurfs uh, i looked Ooh. them up on the wiki just now and their only chapter elk is just a book <laughs> it's just <laughs> a book <laughs> what like a bible or like like a... you got like People call the um, Ultramarines blueberries. I guess you could call them raspberries because they got like the. Oh, jar. yeah. Yeah, what's up with blue raspberry flavoring? That's, that's what's in my head now. It's, it's delicious, is what it is. That's, that's why these chapters go so There's well the together. Blue. What flavors the blue? It's not I raspberry. I don't know. Enough uh, culture. Enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, to lead up to what they were up to until modern times, which is always a weird thing to say discussing a sci-fi franchise, but the modern times of the setting, I guess. They would, over time, strengthen the realm of Ultra Ultramar, and it is largely unaffected by the, all the religious strife and civil wars that plague the rest of the Imperium every five minutes. Uh, although the realm of Ultramar that they officially control does slowly shrink down over the millennia to only a handful of worlds as opposed to the full, the full 500. Uh, but that being said, the Ultramarines did go down to just one chapter so they hardly needed the full 500 anymore uh what they were left with was still more than enough to ensure that they were constantly kept up to date on supplies and whatnot and when gilliman nearly had his uh had ferris manist by fulgrim uh <sighs> fulgrim almost had a two for two on that uh but he was poisoned and gilliman was put into stasis so the ultramarines mm with his absence, would just have to look to the Codex Astartes for guidance on how to handle themselves. Which, if you've ever played the Space Marine video game, you know where this is going. Uh, it turned the Codex from, you know, it's like, hey, this is a you know a good guidebook in, on organization and whatnot for us to listen to, into this is religious doctrine, we need to follow the Codex. Ultramarine exactly. Bible. Yeah it, beca yeah, it became the Ultramarine Bible. In the uh, infamous words of Leandros, the Codex Astartes does not support this action. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the the plus side of this meant that if there's a scenario that is in the Codex that comes up, the Ultramarines are going to face stomp. It's not even going to be close. The downside of that means that uh, they go from just being vulnerable to being wrong-footed to if you can outplan them in even the slightest way, you are going to absolutely crush them. Um, so that's kind of the the way the degradation of the Ultramarines happens. In many ways, they don't lose as much technology as others because McCrag was such a nice little space empire. But their organization, their fighting ability definitely decays because of the Codex and Gilliman getting his head almost taken off. What's with their thing about double power fist? Someone else. I always thought that must be the most useless thing in the entire setting. Is that just a big fist? What are you but talking minus, about? Mine is Caljog. <laughs> big, double. Oh, but he can't Marnie hold anything. He's awesome. He doesn't need to hold anything. He just punches everything. Can I? Can I refer back to the cover of No No Fear with uh, Gilliman literally punching the heads off Word Man? Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's for it's when cool. it's for when they get outsmarted. Now it's time for Marnie's like, Caljog. I don't need subtlety. Boss. Let's be honest, Colin. Yeah. You're you're pro. <laughs> that's good. that almost came out as a very bad sentence. Yeah, you're pro, you're pro double fist <laughs> until it comes to um, an avatar of Cain. Uh, we'll get to that. Don't don't. Oh, sorry, uh, bring spoiler, up spoiler, bring up not we, such heresy. Did we mention that uh, Gilman became Alpharius? I'm I, I'm not humoring that. I'm not humoring before that. <laughs> no, uh, uh, Eli, um, you want to explain that theory? <laughs> well, Gil Gilman went to the Alpha Legion then allegedly killed someone who he thought was Omega on, but everyone else died, and then uh, Gilliman came back, basically, and everything was fine. 
So G- Gilman self-areas. Don't worry about it. How I nah, should... Nah, nah, nah. Megan's I... a short ass. You would have noticed. Oh, so, yeah. Hang on. He's <laughs> the same height as a normal Astartes. That Gil- doesn't make sense. Gilliman just lost three feet in height. What happened? <laughs> Just wearing stilts in his shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I choose to believe that Gilliman once again made the traitors his bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Uh, but anyways, to move on. Uh, Alpha Legion. I think about the Alpha Legion, I get annoyed. <laughs> uh, but fair, that is so. Uh, that is a theory that happened. Um, anyways, uh, a little bit of a opinion from me again. Uh, McCrog itself sort of becomes a, a, a Constantinople to Terra's Rome and that it is a much nicer and place to live and arguably a better source of practical power because Terra after the Horus Heresy becomes a a, a bit of a trash fire, <laughs> as it's it like were. It's a stacked upon stacked world of pil- yeah. like a pilgrim world, isn't it? Yeah, it's a it's a pilgrim world, and the pilgrimage queues are so long that most people die in the in the line. <laughs> Yikes! Oh, man. Yeah. Awesome. I didn't uh, know that. You also can't see the sun uh, from I, a certain level because it's so much smog yeah, and it's, it's a hive world and, and there's incense. so much stuff. Uh, but you know, it, Terra does still similar to Rome has a very large amount of religious and symbolic status. But Macrog, at least I would argue, has more practical worth as a governing body but again this is a little bit of colin throwing out uh equal parts theory and ultramarines propaganda and favoritism so take that with a grain of salt and with that being said ever since the horus heresy the ultramarines have pretty much spent time just fighting every single enemy the imperium has to offer and usually winning uh they fought the tau who at one point wrong-footed them pretty hard like i mentioned earlier when the Tau memorized the Codex Astartes in its entirety. Don't know how they managed that, because that is a very big book. Uh, but they did, and used it to fight the Ultramarines off, and it went pretty well for the Tau. But then the, the Ultramarines just fortified their borders, and then the Tau couldn't really get past it. They've, uh... Mm, Marnius Calgar certainly did fight in Avatar of Cain. Uh, that so, is, that's a sad... You're conflicted uh, on that, I can tell. That is most definitely a thing that happened. Uh, I don't need to be conflicted. That is simply Wardian propaganda to make the Ultramarines look good. As we all know, uh, <laughs> everything is canon. Not everything is true. Uh, so that is just Ultramarine propaganda that Marnius Calgar 1v1 in Avatar of Kanan and won. For someone who's new, does anyone want to explain them why the, what the Matt Ward jokes are? Uh, hmm. If uh, is anyone else dying to get to this? Otherwise, I can. Uh, I think Eli I got guess... particular hatred. To be honest, I can sense I don't, it. I don't, I don't. I don't hate my ward. I did when I was a little kid because I was like, "Oh, these <laughs> Ultramarine guys get all the get mm. all the cool stuff. Why can't my guys be cool yeah. like them?" Hey. But, uh, I was he, too he, little Matt Ward writes some good stuff, but he also writes anything with an Ultramarine on the cover. It's like they have so much plot armor. They get to do the cooler stuff, and and it unbalances the kind of. Um, the whole like, what's the power level level of like a space marine? And then all of a sudden they're doing stuff that like Primarchs don't even do. You go, hang on a minute, he's just like a he's just like a dude. He's a superhuman dude, but he yeah. shouldn't be able to like do this. That's 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 mental. Like Lorgar struggling to kill an avatar of Cain in the Horus mm-hmm. Heresy, and Marnius yeah. Calgar, a just marine, one v one ing it, one v one ing it. Yeah. I, uh... Doesn't the um the librarian of the uh, Ultramarines also like fend off an entire Tyranid oh, hive fleet? Oh no, own? he makes contact with a hive mind. <laughs> Yeah, that's the and one. And <laughs> doesn't go insane. Uh, yeah, so I will say of this about Matt Ward, uh, when he's writing dialogue and such, and plot stuff that isn't necessary about the Ultramarines, he's actually a fairly good writer. I don't know if you guys know, but he wrote the dialogue for Vermintide, at least a lot of oh, it. Oh, yeah. That. And uh, that, that, honestly, that game, I might, I would say, has some of the best like dialogue out of any cooperative. It redeems game. him. It redeems him. Uh, I th- believe he also wrote Battlefleet Gothic. Ooh, at least that. some of the plot. And, of course, he is responsible for bringing Trazen the Infinite to the rest of the world. Which, oh, gotta love Trazen. The, oh, have to thank and him. the Demon Yalava, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, that's Gray McNeil, remember? Say, Gray okay, McNeil. Don't mind me, then. I've just, like, fused the, the anger that people have for Matt Ward onto, like, <laughs> yeah. the most disgusting thing in the set. It is an ultramarine <laughs> story, to be fair. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's why I'm where thinking, the confusion yeah, comes why. from. Um, but, yeah, for the general controversy, he's not the worst writer. 
but when he has a favorite, by God, are you going to know <laughs> that they are Matt Ward's favorite chapter? A bit Mary Sue. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, what's he, the other the yeah, male equivalent? The Grey Knights as well. Gary Stu. Gary, Gary Stu. But Gary, Gary Stu. Yeah, he's also <laughs> he has also... a white scarf, and it makes me offended because all my favorite characters die. <laughs> he, also, he also helmed, yeah, the uh, the Grey Knights. Uh, some questionable lore there. <laughs> Enough said. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, away Matt, from the pain. Matt Ward is responsible for quite a bit of the Ultramarines lore being as uh, controversial, shall we say? But to get into the the lore itself, you know, talk about it. Uh, the most perhaps noteworthy battle the Ultramarines have faced was against the Tyranids. Now, during the first Tyrannic War, when no one, you know, they were new to the Imperium to the galaxy. Naturally, people don't really know how to fight them. And because, you know, when you don't know what you're doing, or when the Ultramarines don't know how to react to the situation, because it's not in the Codex, they're in trouble. Uh, there was, and it was even worse with the Tyranids, because, well, yeah, you might know, the, uh, the Tyranids have synapse creatures that connect the individual forms to the hive mind. No one really knew that at first. It was just, here is an endless swarm of beasts... There's no supply chains to disrupt. There's no chain of command. There's just a bunch of them trying to kill us. And though they did eventually manage to repulse High Fleet Behemoth, or Behemoth, or however you say it, the uh, first major High Fleet invasion, the entire first company, which is the best of the best of the chapter, was wiped to a man, and the rest of the company suffered pretty serious losses as well. And Marnius Kalgar himself, their chapter master, was almost slain. Uh, true to form, though, to the Ultramarines, this would result in the formation of the Tyrannic War veterans, who were Ultramarines specialized in fighting the Tyranids. So, like I said, Ultramarines got wrong-footed, it stung pretty bad, but now they're ready to go, and they know how to handle the oh, Tyranids. Like, did you call for an exterminator? Yeah. <laughs> they're the <laughs> galaxy's best pest control. And, sure enough, come the battle against the next Hive Fleet, Leviathan, the Ultramarines were more prepared, and their losses were not as bad. That being said, the battle was still costly, and who was almost wiped out were the size of the Emperor, and, of course, the Lamenters. <laughs> because, of course, the Lamenters oh, were almost God, wiped out. God, they don't out. catch up, right? <laughs> <laughs> that whole I was thing. reading the page of the wiki, I was like, oh, good, the Lamenters are mentioned. I wonder what's happening. Oh, right, <laughs> they're almost being wiped out. What a surprise. Well, Has Algar it... lost all his limbs yet? Uh, no. Uh, I so believe. The next one? Oh, that was. Uh, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned a bit more. That was uh, that was Bayamoth, I believe, when he uh was one v one the swarm. Lord? Uh, yeah, he one v one the swarm lord and found out. Oh, that's not a good idea. I'm just thinking of the uh, the Black Knight from Monty Python, where he's just like losing a yeah, limb. Like, I'm that invincible. Was a... You're a loony. <laughs> that was a TTS joke, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We'll it was. call it a draw. <laughs> yeah. Isn't the interesting part as well that. They had to def I don't know if this is a spoiler, if you're going to go into it, but they had to defy the Codex Astartes to beat the Tyranids. Indeed. the uh, Which is insane for these people, say the considering... Yeah. The go ahead, sorry? Say, yeah, the Tyrannic War veterans are not in the Codex, because 10,000 years ago, when Gilliman wrote it, the Tyranids weren't a thing. Uh, which should go to show you just how far they were pushed to the brink, that the people who worship it as basically their bible like you said andy went maybe we should maybe we should make some changes make some additions still waiting for the uh, resurrected primark rebute government to draft the codex attractees so they can learn how to talk to girls and I, oh we never learned <laughs> oh, wow. it wow <laughs> dad i don't know how to talk got to girls roasted. okay Fe now he's got a girlfriend it's fine featuring an excerpt from your <laughs> Oh. <laughs> we haven't, just, we haven't explained that just yet. Just let them know about your we'll, personality we'll to, and interests, we'll get, Yvrain. We'll get to it. She's no fan of the mongrel dogs of the Empire. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> this is not how you honor the sick house and the tribes uh, of the unmourned. All right. Oh, I've got another video to show you later of Dagoth or Hal. Uh, but to get oh to the <laughs> yes, too, too many. Too many. Uh, naturally, this is the part where you remember, oh, right, Colin has his preferences, doesn't he, for his favorite faction. Because during the fight against High Fleet Leviathan, it is of note that the Ultramarines only faced half of Leviathan. The other half squarely aimed at Craftworld Iamden, uh, who stabbed it so hard that the Hive might itself felt it. So, yet, eat that, 
Tigrarius. Mr. Librarian who can talk to the hive mind. You didn't hurt it. Eldar he will. Ariel did. Elda another common Eldar W. No one call me out on that. No one no one bring up all of the it only, L's. It only took all of the craft world. No, it only took four fifths of the craft world. <laughs> and some from be all the other craft worlds. <laughs> oh, poor I Uh but you know, the fair's fair. Ultramarines held off half of it. The Elder held off the other half. It was a joint effort, which is a theme that'll come up in the Ultramarines. Uh, we were t talking about Matt Ward earlier. Cato Sicarius also fought a Catan Shard by himself and won. And Marnius Calgar wielded a Necron Pylon like a weapon. Which, for reference, yeah, imagine awesome. someone picking up a fire station and beating someone to death with it. I'm getting Metal Gear Rising, uh, you know, scenes where like, he just picks up oh, the Metal, Metal Gear, Gear by a hand and just goes, thump. All right, now yeah. see, if they portrayed it like that, I would have looked at it a little bit more favorably. <laughs> which, which Catan shot did Kato? I think was it an Avatar the... of Kane? No, I think it was the That's Calgar. Nightbringer? Isn't that Uriel Ventress? Chance. <laughs> uh, Uriel Ventress fights a Catan shard as as I think it might, I think he might fight one as well. <laughs> They're all getting a piece of. Katan I think I think people shard. have to. If you if you're watching, comment below if we uh we, with law if we law crime that. But it's like the idea of the Ultramarines are back at base and they're like, oh, I beat up Catan shards for breakfast. It's <laughs> yeah. not a big deal. It's, uh, uh, hasn't beaten that. Yeah, Blood Angels. You haven't beaten a Catan shard yet. Oh, keep up. This is, uh, the Eldar and their orcs at their heights could barely handle the Catan. Thankfully, the Ultramarines are the greatest of them all. Thank, thank God just... I, Kato Sakaris, <laughs> is, is here to stop your Catan shot. Oh. Pull over, Karen. Matt Ward, everyone! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to get to modern times now, because that, uh, that little segment of the Ultramarines beating everything they come across is essentially their history for the last next 10,000 years from the Horus Heresy to modern times. And speaking of which, we now get to modern times. And who else returns but their Primarch? Uh, Belisarius Call fashioned him a very nice piece of armor. Yvrain kissed his boo-boos with space elf <gasps> magic. That's what you going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah whoa. Uh, <laughs> Belisarius gave him the drip and then your rain kissed him okay mm -hmm. it, was, it was like no it was just like sleeping beauty true love's kiss uh, and Gilliman is back uh, first thing he does is beat several hundred chaos marines to death barehanded might not have been hundred but hundred sounded like a cooler number to me so he punched a lot of people to death when he woke up oh that scene though when they uh, he basically gets the armor of fate like stuck on him He's like a little chamber, and like they're fighting in the fortress of Hera around him, and the Ultramarines and Calgar, like, they're basically being swarmed by, by Chaos Marines. Mm -hmm. And then immediately it opens. It, it goes ding, like a little toaster. And then it <laughs> opens, and it said, like, Gilliman's face, isn't it? He's like, his face is like pure hate. And all of them just stop. I find that, I always loved that part. It was so funny when I first read it. Cause it makes me think of um, Sauron in the first Lord of the Rings where he's just looming over the soldiers and with the big mm. mace in his hand and he just goes, right, baff, and they just go flying. <laughs> it's it's so a, good as well. I'm, oh, go ahead, Sauron? Say, I'm imagining the, the Rogue One scene with Darth Vader. It's like the door opens oh, and it's just yeah. a bright mark. <laughs> And they're like okay, all space marines shouting at the door, like "Let us out!" <gasps> <Tell> <laughs> us. I mean, hey, was imagine it... you're ten thousand years old. You've been through like the Horus Heresy, and you're like, "Oh, we've got this," and the "Oh, come on!" And then the only <laughs> remaining loyalist Primarch, son of God, op walks through the door. You're like, "Nope, I'm mm -hmm. out. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out." Well, funny enough, they had, was it? They had he he's holding the flaming sword of the Emperor, and they're all just staring at him. And like, no, it's really funny. They said you can hear the background battle, but everyone's like, "Imagine it's like you catch your kids fighting, and you're not, and you walk <laughs> in, and, and they're all like staring." And then one like berserker just yells. He runs at him, and he just like just claps him in half, and then just boom, yeah. he puts a helmet on, and he's just, like just duff, 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 and just runs into them, <laughs> like nice. just basically annihilates everyone. Yeah, really it's so good. It was. I know. It's a gathering storm. Gathering storm. Noah, I know that's you know this is Ultramarines, not just Gilman, but that's too cool a scene to not talk about. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, the Ultramarines were holding it down as well. They were. For... Uh, to give them credit, it was. It yeah. wasn't that the Ultramarines like, oh, they're getting pushed back. They need their Primarch. It was. These are overwhelming amounts of Chaos Marines showing up because they got an inkling of what was going on with Gilman in there, and they did not want that succeeding. Was it and specifically a particular ba- war band, or who, believe, who were the Chaos Marines? I believe they uh, were Black Legion. Black, yeah. Black Legion. Ah, fair yeah. enough. Black Legionnaires. They uh, <laughs> they went from a victory at Cadia to oh no, we don't want him waking up. That's got that's, a little bit too big of an ear. Like oh, we blew up Cadia. We can do anything. Ne- never mind. Literally, never mind. the you're stuck in here with me. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's waking up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and with that, the Ultramarines have been given new life uh, with Gilman returning. The uh. He's begun revising the Codex a bit because he looked at what happened at the Imperium. Cried a lot on the inside, probably. He's not a fan of what's turned into the Imperium. And went to work fixing it, which included revising his Codex so his sons would learn to have just a little bit of originality in them again. And Krog and the Imperium Ultramar as a whole have more or less become independent. They're, you know, they're not, not in the sense of we have succeeded. We are no longer part of the Imperium, but Gilliman and the Ultramarines directly oversee it with Marnius Calgar, if I remember correctly. He is the one in charge of overseeing it uh, himself. I think the plan is to turn into like a kind of, it's like a bastion realm where they want to draw chaos to fight on their turf. Yeah. So they've turned it into kind of a fortified area. And uh, for- it behind it. For the for the historical inspiration, it is more and more becoming the Eastern Roman Empire to the decaying uh, Imperium Western Roman Empire, uh, with Macrog getting its own little renaissance and everything else is falling apart. I bet the Dark Angels are furious. <laughs> <laughs> like, we wanted somewhat independence for ages, and they get it. <laughs> well, the like house it. is made of like rocks now, and it flies. Oh, well, it's terrible. They should have had their sleeping Where's dad wake up dad? first. Where's my dad? If only they knew to just go into the basement. <laughs> that is a sleeping. It's in kind the of uh, it's kind of cool for the Ultrarines as well because they're the only chapter where, throughout the ten thousand years, the Imperium was rotting they could actually see like because their primarch was in stasis in the fortress of hera mm-hmm. they could actually see a primarch like because obviously most of the imperium was like it was a myth wasn't it like oh yeah the primarchs were beings of myth but mm-hmm. every ultramarine literally saw gilliman it's like yeah as yeah. they were like training or like, was, you know, uh, basically i guess to an extent the blood out. angels could watch their their mm-hmm. dad's sarcophagus and be like i'm sad i'm still sad <laughs> it's better than what the iron hands got is I sanguine mean, I mean, buried hey. on Gaul? I'm pretty, pretty sure he I was because he, he, he got killed and then Rogel Dawn took him to the uh, to Holy Tower. Then the Blood Angels put him in a golden casket and took him to Baal, didn't they? And that was a. I, I'll go sorry. I say that was a big worry with the devastation of Baal because they didn't want the Tyranids getting Primarch DNA because that would have been yeah. bad. Yikes! Yikes! Um, Tyranid with long flowing luscious hair. Like, oh no, what have you done? <laughs> it's a. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was a really good point you brought up for a while. Like, you were the only ones who were like, we know they existed for certain. We know what they were kind of like. Because we're looking at one of them. He's at a glass case like Lennon over there. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking of that Simpsons sketch now where he just smashes out. Just... Oh, I can't, I don't, I can't believe I've ever thought about that. That's amazing. Um, oh, there, was, there was some friction when Gilman came back a bit. Uh, between him and Calgar, uh, because it was it was actually kind of funny, because in Calgar's mind, you know, these are ten thousand year old sacred relics of his, you know, his Primarch, and Gilman, like from his perspective, it's been like five minutes since he last used them because he was put in a coma, so it wasn't like he was conscious those ten thousand years. So he just shows up and he's like, "Why are you venerating my old trash?" This is a pencil. This is not a sacred object, Calgar. <laughs> that just reminds me of Red Dwarf, with like Lister has like a, I think a grocery list in his back pocket or something, and then the cats of the ship evolve and they leave to find the promised land, and they use his like list as coordinates, and it's so stupid. <laughs> it's kind of like what it is. Oh, um, and some other stuff that was happening, of course, the Primaris Marines, uh, the Ultra Ultramarines, as it were. Uh, Gilliman nice. and Call's blasphemous, blasphemous hordes. Uh, if you're not a fan of the Primaris Marines, mm-hmm. they uh, 
Gilliman sent them across the galaxy, oftentimes delivering them directly. Uh, I know Gilliman directly delivered them to the Dark Angels. In fact, the Dark Angels briefly thought that the jig was up with the whole fallen thing. Uh, and the needle being panic. replaced. <laughs> I think they, they debated opening fire on him, and it was only Asriel that was like, no, 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 if this is our time, it's time to suck it up. Oh, he's the one who, like, he actually had to hold his nerve because he was the one who thought that, he, that uh, Gilliman had come to annihilate them. And then he was like, uh, I'm just going to let him on board. <laughs> and he just <laughs> basically just got a like, win. Asriel just... clenched very tight. Yeah, like, just going to face the music now. And then it turns out Gilliman's just here with presents. And Gilliman like, must know, no... surely. Uh, uh, would he? There's not much that escapes Gilliman. To be he fair. had some. He had some doubts with uh, Cipher going to Terra. Um, as we'll cover that a bit more extensively in his own video. But Gilliman does speak with the Emperor when he wakes up, and did promise Cipher, a fallen Dark Angel, the chance to speak to him as well. And then he looked at the sword on Cipher's back and was like, "No, no, you don't get to speak to Dad. No way in hell." Wait, is that the lions? I've seen that. Uh, it's like, wait, I a, broke that over my knee. Wait on, what, a minute. Are you, are you putting that? Yeah. So, I don't know if he specifically knows about the whole fallen kerfuffle. I would not be surprised if he's aware that there's some less than savory dark angels out there, though. Mm. Um, I've always I've thought about it, but I haven't. I'm still unsure. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll be there. a we'll see soon if the lion comes back soon. Yeah, we'll see soon, won't we? Yeah, that's Can't a, wait. I imagine that's got to be going somewhere. And uh, some other stuff they've been up to. The Plague Wars, where Mertarian and the Death Guard decided they wanted a bite of Ultramar. They were repulsed, but it did end up as a bit of a Pyrrhic victory as the Death Guard got some permanent real space presence. Uh, although it was only three planets, if I remember reading correctly. So it's not like all of Ultramar is falling apart, but... Three planets is three more planets more of Nurgle infestation than you want in your empire. So, mm. still not great, but could have been a lot worse. And I think the thing is, as well, that I was thinking about this early um, early in the week. When he, like, because Gilliman fights Mortarion, Gilliman's fought every traitor Primarch, I think, other than Perturabo and Horus. And he's not going to get a chance with Horus, so I thought that was interesting. Like, he must have oh, fought yeah. the most. That is true, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Gilliman has gotten around. To be fair, he's always done okay in the fights. He's not considered the best. He's always outmatched, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the problem with being the administrative Primarch when it's time for a fist fight. <laughs> he won't win the battle, but he'll win the war. Yeah, he's uh, if, if in a 1v1, he's not winning, but there's a reason Horus was afraid of the Ultramarines and not Gilliman specifically. Well, the Ultramarines are the first to cross the Rubicon Primaris, too. They the were. Counter. I think so. It was uh, Marnius Calgar, the first one to go through the procedure as yeah. a existing first foreign space marine and become a Primaris marine. So, of course, you know, there was already the millions of Primaris that were created, but Calgar was the first one to become a Primaris from a firstborn. I think he, him and like, three others took it with him, but they all died. And he was the only one who uh, yeah. made it, I think. Dang. He's the only one. It's quite sad. He's the only named character with a mini who did it. True. That's kind of cool, though, as well. We'll, well. we obviously know the reason why he was the first one to yeah, cross. Yeah. No, a mini miniature line. You know, it's a setting. It's not a, sto it's not a linear story, necessarily. But mm -hmm. that's still and kind of the cool. The people though. doing the operation were like, we need someone pretty tough to endure this. And they saw his massive gauntlet, so like... I think he'll be fine. Right. He'll be if, fine. If he can hold those things, he can handle this. <laughs> they do describe it in the uh, the book Darkness and the Blood, because they do it to Mephiston, and they describe how the operation works, so they kind of... it's. I mean, this might be a bit too graphic, but like, they do like literally cut you open, like kind of peel you back, shall we say. And they like, kind of feed in like tubes over your chest. Like It's really funny... It's not funny, but it's funny <laughs> when they like they have to like peel off Mephiston's face, and then they have to like make his face bigger, and then they put the face back on, which always confused me. I like, wouldn't want to surely do the it's surgery not the same on Mephiston. Size. He'd probably stare at you while you did it. It's like, oh, he was dead not... when it happened. He was one hundred percent dead. So, yeah, yeah, but he still have his eyes open just to be creepy and be like, mm -hmm. his his soul was in the warp when it was happening, and his like actual they had Hanging to like out. massage his heart whilst it was happening, and he almost oh. didn't make it. 
because apparently the Rubicon Primaris is it doesn't work as well on legions with like a unique gene seed. Other than like obviously again, Ultramarine's gene seed is stable, so, so they don't need so it with so uh, all theirs. of them. <laughs> yeah, so the Ultramarines had a had a much more successful time of crossing the Rubicon Primaris. I think it's, it says that, or it's implied. So basically, Dark Angels and Ultramarines are the only ones who aren't going to have the worst and white time scars. with it. And white Pardon me, White Scars. Yeah, I just like fist. the idea of the three of them just like, oh, it's having a tough time there, uh, Space Wolf. Ah, it's a shame, it's a shame. Just having a cigarette in the back. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I heard you had trouble crossing your Rubicon Primaries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know. If your Belisari was... Infernus doesn't kick in for four hours... <laughs> Oh, what's the, the what's, what's the heart thing called? It's the in, the the Belisarius. Oh, in, it's wait, a really cool the, name. The, it's, it's like the, the Belisarius Infernus. Furnace. It was Inferno or something. Like the uh, maybe the it's second like Infernus to make it sound more <laughs> fancy. Like the really cool part. But yeah, uh, I always got the name of it. There's something else, but I I didn't. We'll think of it at some point. But I, was, that's I like wasn't really cool I, I wasn't prepared to discuss Primaris Anatomy, so I don't know the name of it off the top of my head. Well, essentially, this makes for people who are new. I've this just is the... It's the Belisarian furnace. Oh, hey. that's so cool! Nice. There's, there's a few as well. There's there's the Belisarian furnace, the Magnificat, and the sinew coils. Oh yeah, that's the bit where they were they were shoving metal over yeah. like the muscle. It was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> more ultramarines. Oh, more yeah, ultramarines. <laughs> Uh, and one more important thing of note is the time that the Ultramarines uh, collaborated with the Eldar to get a whole bunch of Imperial officials killed. I'd like to talk about that. Oh, oh, what? This was uh, during the Vigilus campaign, which was one of those big uh, narrative events after Cadia that GW was doing, where pretty much every faction showed up to throw down. So Vigilus is one of the two places where you can safely cross the Great Rift, which for those of you who don't know is the massive warp storm that tears the galaxy in half and makes it pretty much untraversable. Or What's the other one? I I'm not sure don't there's remember a second the name one, of the other one. I know there's two. And Vigilus is one of them, and this was the one that was the focus of the campaign. Uh, so, the Eldar show up trying to stop some chaos threats from growing out of control. The problem is the Dark Eldar had showed up before them, and did to the Imperial Guard what the Dark Elder are known to do. Uh, murder and kidnap and just be the, the worst in general. Turn them into furniture. Uh, yeah, turn them into furniture. Literally. Yeah. Uh, so when the Eldar Elder, you know, the Craft World Elder showed, it'd be like, we, the chaos, we got to stop this. The uh, Many of the officials and some of the generals in charge went, oh, more Eldar. You're going to pay for what you did. And when the Eldar tried to explain, no, that wasn't us, that was a different Eldar, that the... Just imagine them going, same team, same team, yeah, same team, yeah, the, same uh, team! The Imperials responded with lasgun fire and such. Stupid mongrel dogs of the Empire. Exactly. Every time. Stupid it's not how you honor it's not how you honor the sick house of the yeah. tribes of the unmourned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get I'm gonna do that once. We need more of that. More. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so what ends up happening is those Eldar retreat, uh, they're from Craftworld Saimhan, they're like, alright, screw this, you don't get help anymore. Uh, but they do begin speaking with Marnius Kalgar, and, and you know, form a bit of a truce, and part of the terms of the truce is Saimhan, the Craftworld Eldar, they're like, we still have, we have unfinished business with those people who opened fire on us before we're gonna help you, and Marnius was like... All right. Well, they're imperial officials, so they're probably corrupt and worthless anyway. Let's let's go solve this. Uh, so I believe what happened was, Marnius Calgar and other Ultramarine officers said there will be a meeting inside of the uh, inside of this building. Uh, please meet us inside of the room. We will be there shortly. Uh, and then all of the officials piled into the building. The Ultramarines locked the door behind them, and then it was revealed that the building was filled with angry magical space elves. Oof. Uh, hey, what the heck? That's yeah. kind of cool, though. That's really cool. And uh, and then there was... <laughs> and then there was no more blood debt. Uh, feel free to imagine however you think that played out in your own head. <laughs> Maybe they all had tea and crumpets and made up with each other. And then yelled <laughs> then, for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh... But that is largely what the Ultramarines are up to in modern times. 
for a bit about their organization. They're, of course, adherent to the Codex, with 10 companies each, creating a total of 1,000 Marines, roughly. Uh, a little bit of Codex deviation, both with the Tyrannic War veterans and the, uh, the poor old Genesis chapter, who exists solely to give the Ultramarines men whenever they <laughs> need it. Uh, but largely adherent to the Codex. Um, and I even... They're not taking the piss like the Black Templar suit. It's like, oh yeah, Codex. Uh, that, yeah, that's no, cute. No, no. That's cute. And Space Wolves are like, ah, that's very cute. Wink, wink. Yeah, stupid wolves. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and unlike many other chapters, material wa- losses are very swiftly replaced. Ultramar is quite the big realm for a single chapter, even as over time it kind of shrank a bit. And it pretty much ensured that the Ultramarines suffered the least amount of technological regression out of all legions except the Dark Angels. Uh, Dark Angels still had a lot of fancy toys that we'll talk about later. Uh, But the Ultramarines definitely weren't doing too bad in that front either. And they also have, you know, a bit of a modest fleet. Uh, It's not the biggest in the Imperium. The the wiki even makes a point of going, listen... It's not the biggest. Gilliman, not not the biggest fan of fleet battles. He wants to get, you know, he wants to fight on the ground, boots on the ground. I know, I know. Before the we started the the, the podcast today, we we were talking about Michael Caine. He's just there going, <laughs> "It's not the size that matters; it's how you use it." Yeah, oh, that's it. That's not how I thought Michael Caine would be <laughs> referencing Warhammer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's yeah. it's applicable. It makes sense. Uh, that's to true, how they that's true. fleet combat and they do have the biggest one of the biggest ships in the fleet in the I whole would, imperium at least i was gonna say the uh the macrag's honor one of the few remaining gloriana class battleships in the imperium left did uh, huron blackheart not steal that one uh he own a different ultramarines ship i i doubt he was still that one because i think uh I gilliman's that, on it <laughs> that's a steel gilliman too <laughs> oh god we... I, they can't there was a whole thing Actually, they tried to go kill Gilliman. This is like, this is newer lore, I think, in the newer. You're on Black. That's Coast. when he tried to get back to Terra, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was on, I know he. I don't think he needs it though, by Kairos Fate Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know why him, but I guess all the Chaos Gods had to make an appearance. <laughs> uh, but as for the, you know, as for the fleet of it, they have that one, and when Gilliman returned, they, uh, you know, they buffed their fleet up a little bit. Not a lot, but they just pulled two more Gloriana class battleships just from somewhere and just added it to the fleet. Huh? I, I don't know about this. They just I, found them. I, I, oh, these will do. I couldn't find a source on where they came from, but it just said, yeah, two more Gloriana class battleships, part of the Ultramarines fleet. Huh. It must be part of the Indomitus Crusade. Probably. For someone who's new, that's the ongoing, I guess, storyline of Warhammer, the Indomitus Crusade it's, book, yeah. Dawn of Fire, isn't it? It's Which is the, mostly held by the Ultramarines, to be fair. Yeah, the uh, the Ultramarines doing their best to stave off the collapse of the Imperium and give everyone the biz- business. Which, fair is fair. They've been doing a pretty good job at it so far. Uh, but yeah, also, uh, if you're wondering what a Glorana class battle cruiser is, imagine that really big uh, Star Destroyer from Episode Five that crashes into the Death Star. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now imagine that the Ultramarines just found two more. They, they just found them lying in a bin somewhere. Well, the thing is, they were supposed to be made for each of the Primarchs, so did they get them from, like, a storeroom of the lost Primarchs? <laughs> or did they, just, did they just nick Conrad Kurz's one and go, like, we're repainting this? <laughs> you know? I like to imagine that they showed up to, like, the, the Blood Angels Fortress Monastery. like... I'm, I don't see a Primark here. I think we'll be taking this now. <laughs> oh, my God. This belongs to Gilliman now, buddy. Oh. oh. But wherever they got them, their fleet, you know, it got an upgrade. Uh, as for a couple important people, Gilliman, he's, you know, he's their dad. He's the foundation of the Legion. As Papa Smurf. All, Papa Smurf, indeed. I think he'd, he'd be Grandpa Smurf, wouldn't he? Marnius Calgar is Papa Smurf. Yeah. Uh, the, whoever was leading the Legion Smurf, before Gilliman Smurf, can be Smurf politics. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, did Marnius Calgar even come to be? He, uh, How old is he? He is, I believe, a. He's been running the Ultramarines for. I believe it was roughly a thousand years. Nice. Eight hundred, may or oh, might be a thousand now. Actually, I well, yeah, with the really the Indominus Crusade and the setting moving forward, I think it's closer to a thousand. 
Uh, he's been he's been around. He's been in charge for a while. Speaking oh. of, he's a uh, he's the next guy I wanted to bring up. He's a. Uh, from the era of Matt Ward, he is the spiritual liege of every space marine in the galaxy. Every chapter master looks up to him and wishes to be him. They wish to be ultramarines. <laughs> I I have 110% unironically brought, bought into Matt Ward propaganda. <laughs> and if you have a complaint with it, your legion is fatherless. <laughs> I'm just imagining Dante and Bjorn the Fal- Falhanda just ro- rolling their eyes so heavily like, oh, we've been here longer than this guy. Jeez. Yeah. And on for- in the background, the Ultramarines chant from Chaos Gate is blurred. <laughs> 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 oh, he's, uh, you know, he, uh, if anyone read that Marvel comic, Marvel comic, uh, the name Marnius Calgar isn't actually his original name. He took it oh, on yeah. from another Marnius Calgar. Uh, He's his killed. friend, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, and he ca- took it on to honor the name. Uh, and that same conic, he also ripped off a Lord of Skulls head and shot down its neck hole. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's a, just Calgar. to be sure, just in case, just in case the decapitation didn't get the job done. Did he fly up on? How did he get to the neck? I think I he might have flown. That. Yeah, I th- like a jump pack or something, <laughs> or maybe he just <laughs> jumped. I just don't know why. Jump. I just saw Marnius in my brain, like on a unicorn flying up. Because the way you said, like, and then yeah. he flew up into the sky. Like, what is this? He ran this on all fours. Um, I like, he didn't put enough points into his mounts and total war hammers, so he stuck with the bag. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, he's uh, he's the chapter master, though. Even with Gillen returning, he still holds the position of chapter master. He's, of course, subservient to Gilliman, but he's the one running the Ultramarines day to day. And, yeah, he's a, he's a pretty smart guy. He actually had a really good bro moment with the Lamenters. They, uh, they turned down a gift from him because they felt they weren't worthy of it. And everyone else there was like, oh, you're snubbing our chapter master, our our gift, huh? You guys suck. And Marnius Calgar was like, you, all of you shut the hell up. Uh, so, yeah, he's actually, he's a pretty cool dude. He didn't go, you bow to no one. And then just like, oh. <laughs> Colin doesn't get that reference because I haven't seen that. I've Lord seen Lord that bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... Nice. I'm gonna scream. I'm gonna can't, can't <laughs> really lament as anything because he'll probably get lost. I'm gonna mail some packages <laughs> oh, out tonight. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I like the. I, what, how what Hal just said. I just imagine the uh, the blood ravens just like licking their lips, going, "Oh, that looks shiny." You know, <laughs> <laughs> they'd steal it from the lamenters. Oh, poor lamenters. Yeah. Uh, next up, Cato Sicarius. He's yeah, I Cato Sicarius. Sakari- <laughs> Sakari- <laughs> Rather divisive character who, depending on how you feel about the Ultramarines and Matt Ultramarine Ward, with ADHD. Uh, yeah, he's either the end all, be all badass under the sun due to fighting everything and winning because he's just so cool, or the biggest Mary Sue garbage character you have ever seen in your life. It, it depends on how you feel about the Ultramarines and Space Marines in general. He's a contrast to a lot of the Ultramarines because he's quite hot-headed. Yeah. Just very different to the order and discipline they're mm-hmm. kind of known for. Which, as a, to be fair to the, the people writing the writings about him, that's uh, something that's been emphasized. Oh, my pump is going off. Uh, whoops. Anyways, uh, he has been mentioned that he's, uh, I believe he was both lost in the warp for a little bit and taken into Gilliman's teach- tutelage. So that's kind of uh, mellowed him out a bit, which, you know, to be fair, if I got lost in hell for however, no, however long, I'd probably be I'd probably be a bit different when I came out. So Cato Sicarius is getting some character development. Uh, there's good, ca- for him. good. Yeah, good for him. Uh, there's Captain Titus, who, if you've played the Space Marine game, you know, is the, uh, the just biggest badass out of every space marine ever. Uh, he understands that the Codex is a source of guidance, not blind worship, which uh, basically Leandros was a Matt Ward stand-in uh, that the creators of the game used to make fun of. Uh, but mm-hmm. Captain Titus, yeah, like I said, he's a cool guy. He is a living blender, by the way. Pretty much single-handedly <laughs> saved a Forge World from orcs and then demons. And fist fought a Chaos Lord in Terminator armor to death. Uh, was taken in by the Inquisition because Leandros is just the worst. The Codex Astartes does not support mm-hmm. this action. But at some point, he was not only released back 
to uh, the Ultramarines, but crossed the Rubicon Primaris. So now he's a Primaris Marine. Space Marine 2 is going to be good. It is. Although I, I look forward to it, but he's not voiced by Mark Strong anymore. So oh, like, he's oh, not. He's got worse. He's yeah. voiced oh. by uh, Rolo from Vikings. That guy. It's cool, That's but good. I'm like, Mark. Yeah, yeah it's cool, but Kings, Mark man. Strong. Oh. If, it, if it wasn't Mark Strong, that's the only person who's like, I'm okay with it. But I'm still like, you know, mm. Mark Strong yeah. still. Well, I'm, there's no no reason to... We'll see how the, we'll see how he does. I look, I look forward to the game either way. Yeah, uh, I just like the idea that when you go undergo the Rubicon Primaris, you get like a voice change. It's just like canon now. <laughs> uh, and speaking of Space Marine 2, he's shortly going to be adding Tyranids to his list of enemies of the Imperium. He just mm. blends. Uh, Raw Dogs, Imperial Guard Lieutenants in his free time. Uh, Lieutenant Mira. Uh, <laughs> just take, <laughs> taking her to town. He's All been right. reading the Codex of Tractions. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Mirosi. Uh, had to get oh, that one in. Lord. Uh, uh, his, his canonicity is also kind of strange because he's the captain of the second company, but supposedly during the time he was captain, Cato Sicaria should have been captain. So there's some weird date stuff kind of going on with them. Yeah. Um, I think we can just chalk that up to Kato having an ego and be like, I was always in charge of the, I was always <laughs> captain or of Or Kato is lost like, in the war. Just the idea of like him being like a lieutenant under Titus. And he was like, yeah, well, act actually, I, um, was I was always the captain. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never heard of this Titus guy before because I'm Kato Sicar I, Kato Sicarius. You know, that sounds like a character trait he'd have. Yeah, I think the one of the solutions was it was when Cato was lost in the warp, Titus was captain. The only problem was, like, the map they show in this first Space Marine game doesn't have the uh, Great Rift on it. But that's, I mean, there's only so much you can do. The Great Rift wasn't a thing, like, in the lore when the Space Marine game was written. It's ten years old now, fair. isn't it? It's, yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, Oof. if you were, like, creating the maps in-universe, you probably wouldn't make the map and then scribble the Rift on top. You'd be like, oh, and... That's up to you. Get your marker pen out. Yeah. It's currently here, you know. Yeah, and there's always, you know, as the uh, the Imperium's uh, communication and bureaucracy is perhaps not the best in the world. <laughs> so you could Philip, all... have you updated the maps? What? Yeah. I haven't had the re requisition order yet. It has to be, like, <laughs> triplicated. Uh, so, yeah, you can always just chalk it up to, well, someone's records got screwed up, which is a pretty good uh, reasoning most of the time. And one last character to bring up, Ilian Nataste, a half Eldar astropath, soul bonded to the Emperor. <sighs> and after serving in an astropath, he then uh, served with the Dark Angels for a while before becoming the head of communications for the Ultramarines. Uh, uh, this is still canon. The Smurfs know the Eldar are the best <laughs> and know they should powder. give them power when they can. <laughs> Propaganda. Uh, as for him it. as for him being canon hell, uh that specifically is not uh that's from Rogue Trader, so that is old uh, lore. Uh, but that being said, uh Ilian Nataste does actually show up again. He's now a just an Eldar. Uh and Eldrad sent him as an advisor to Gilliman during the Indominus Crusade. Uh, Yo, that's kind of cool. Yeah, he was, and I believe he didn't really want to be there, but he's like, "All right, Eldred said to do this. He's the smartest guy that we have. He's he's Eldred. I'll suck it up." <laughs> the damn Monkai, the yeah. Mongol dogs of the uh, Empire. Go, yeah. Is this how you one of the six thousand <laughs> tribes of the Unmourned? <laughs> you gotta just play Morrowind, man. I have. <laughs> oh, do you also uh, have um, Yo Yo Ventress too. Uh, a little bit on him. I, I could riff for he's, days off that guy. Uh, could I finish up Ilian and then yes, if you want to yeah, talk course, about... Yes, of course, of course, of course. Uh, new Ilian, I guess uh, he apparently had some pretty cool conversations with the Ultramarines and Gilliman about the nature of divinity in the setting and even talked about whether or not the Emperor was a god. Which, given that Gilliman's first reaction to speaking to the Emperor was, uh, if you're a god, you're not one worth worshipping, I would love to see that conversation him and that Eldar had. Wow. Uh, yeah, you want to riff on Uriel Ventress? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you, I love you. Your, Uriel Ventress is probably my favorite Ultramarine character because if you haven't read his books or kind of new to Warhammer, his is his um, journey is probably the most human 
a space marine will ever act is a lot of his books are like i mean they have the <coughs> demokulaba <laughs> you know the the the, uh, the most horrifying <laughs> the demonetization book. machine Pretty much yeah. the most horrifying moment in Warhammer. They put you in a lady who's already alive and go like, time to be born again. Oh no. Yeah. But now yeah. you're a space marine and you might not have skin. Yeah. We're going to need lots of stitches to keep you in there. Yeah. Like, oh no. Please stop. Please stop. <laughs> we'll have to cover that tactfully somehow on that on the Euro Ventures. I think episode. we tactfully cover that by not talking we'll do about that it. Video. <laughs> True. Yeah, we tactfully ten, ten ignore it. Subscribers. But uh, Uriel is quite He's so interesting as well because he's kind of he rebels slightly against the Codex Astartes, but in a very different way. Like he actually gets him exiled from the chapter, and he has to earn back his honor. And he's a very—I always find him to be the most compelling Ultramarine character because he's just so human. I think at one point I might be wrong here, but I think he actually cries at a certain point for seeing how certain other—I think it was like a mutant like some mutants he finds it's in the demonculaba book and he cries for like even they hold to the emperor and it's like terrible demon world and he actually like shows a level of humanity which is i think it's again like that kind of could make someone like into a big fan of the ultramarines generally just because the ultramarines are like space marines are so far above being human but the ultramarines like there's still a sense of humanity within them they're not necessarily just weapons I like that uh, a lot about them because they are they are diplomats. They are like politicians. They are so much more than just what is expected. Like a lot of them, I mean, you you could say like I think you guys might agree. Like a lot of these space marine chapters are just like, yep, go in there and like just destroy that thing. They're expected to be like you know the big warrior <laughs> tradition essentially. Go Rex uh, face. Yeah, but then the Ultramarines are... would like to know your location <laughs> so they <laughs> can not. shell it. Yikes! <laughs> but the yeah, the Ultramarines are. They're, they're more than that. They are the all. They're, they're all like I said. Like they don't specialize in just one thing. They're an all round. Well, tradition breeds it into them to like you have to also work with civilians and be statesmen and such. So it it, it makes sense. That's, I, I, that's what makes them so cool. To be honest, and uh, I the Ultramarines actually, or they even uh, spend what little off time a Space Marine has, uh, just going around Macrog and integrating themselves into it. They uh. They're fairly human as far as chapters go. They don't just ignore the rest of humanity. That you can, if you're walking around Macrog, you may damn well find an ultramarine walking into a shop and buying some ancient <laughs> Greek style fruit. In a gigantic BLT, like yeah, crikey, like, I know you guys eat. Massive. Jeez, that's a whole loaf. Watch the door frame. <laughs> but anyway, um, okay, sorry. before we move on to any other bits, I, I was wondering if I might be able to like cram in a couple of Horus Heresy Ultramarines, which I think are quite cool if we have time. By all means. Uh, go that for was it. close to the end of it. Uh, so, yeah. Go uh, go nuts. Uh, so, I've only got three I want to mention. Um, oh, the first one I'll mention is kind of brief. A uh, guy called Tylos Rubio. He was a librarian during the very beginning of the Horus Heresy. Um, this was after the Council of Nikea, where psychos were not allowed to be psychos anymore. And uh, Nathaniel Garrow, the uh, knight errant from the Death Guard, had to assemble a, a team, Avengers style. And Malkador, as the Nick Fury in this situation, uh, there's an image, uh, he sent Nathaniel Garrow to this battle that the Ultramarines were going through. He spoke to Tylos and he's like, right, um, apparently you're a pretty good psyker, innit? And he's like, yep, yeah, but not allowed, sorry. Um, and then he's like, you better, you better hop on your bike, go away. Uh, I'm gonna hear, gonna die with my brothers here, and Gary went, nope, nope, I'm gonna stay with you. Uh, if you're gonna die, I'm gonna die with you. And he went, oh, for fuck. and then he unleashed his powers to save his brethren, and for that he was shunned by his men instantly because they said, hey, you're not really an Ultramarine anymore. You defied the Emperor. You should be punished. And Garo said, hey, come with me. You can become a Knight Errant. You have to swear off being an Ultramarine, but you get some cool armor. You get to be my second in command, sort of. And we're gonna we're gonna make a team, and so he does that, and he he fights throughout the whole uh, Horus Heresy, and he becomes one of the founding Supreme Grand Masters of the Grey Knights chapter. So that's a fun little tidbit. Um, another cool character, Remus Ventanus, known as the Savior of Kalf, was the fourth captain of the Ultramarines. Uh, I'm not sure which company, but one of them, and he was instrumental in saving Kalf from being overrun by the Word Bearers and. It kind of became an irradiated hellhole anyway, but he did his best. 
Fun fact about him, uh, Uriel Ventris went to visit his gravestone when there was a battle ensuing with, I think you mentioned earlier, Hal, with Honsu, and Remus came back as a Legion of the Dead and helped fight back the Iron Warriors with Ventress as like a and Ventress um I think at the time was um quite young, but I'm not sure. My mind is either saying he was actually an ultramarine at the time or he was a child. I'm not sure which one it is in my memory. I think banks. he might have been an ultramarine. He, yeah, he's I think also he was. he's also Euro Ventress is also descended from another ultramarine hero as well. Which is quite fun. So yeah. there's like a tradition of like, I, I don't know if it's like, obviously, how does how the hell does he? Uh, he must be an uncle, you know, like a great uncle or something. <laughs> because there's no way, obviously, you know, they're kids. So this you is know, the, I mean. the Habsburg family tree happening in the Ultramarines. You mean the Habsburg circle? The the, the, fam, the Habsburg well, family it, Christmas wreath. It, to be fair, <laughs> Ultramarines can have like children before they become Ultramarines. Like in in the Horus Heresy, especially, there were a lot of them who were like, "I'm already an adult." I'll be turned into an Astartes anyway, and they already had kids. And the Space Wolves have that as well. Like, um, I can't remember his name, the guy with the massive hammer who's like in charge of the Wolf Guard. I think he had like RG? family. I remember just reading. Yeah, oh, I feel R like R Jack. Yeah. Because he was massive. He was like, I can take it. Yeah. And he was already really strong. And I think he had a family beforehand. Does um, but either way, it was it was a nice thing with um, Uriel and Remus because they were both captain of the fourth company. And it was like, he came back and like on fire with his ultramarine sigil on his black armor. Like, I'm a Legion of the Damned. I will help you because I'm a good guy. Yeah. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention is Aeonid Thiel. who was um, a sergeant uh, of the ultramarines during Kalf. Uh, he was sent to the McCrag's honor to face censure because he had been uh, writing theoreticals on how to fight space marines before you were allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So he was going to be punished and possibly executed for heresy. Uh, they painted his helmet red as a mark of censure. Then Kalf happened. He was on the bridge. He was not on the bridge. He was near the bridge of the the um, the McCrag's honor, and he was be before the actual battle erupted. He was in Rabute's chambers waiting to be punished and he saw his private armory and he just started like taking weapons off the wall and like playing <laughs> around with them because he was like i'm nice. gonna possibly get screwed anyway i might as well play around and then I'm, i currently just finished doing a video on him he he goes oh what's that battle outside oh that's a demon bang that doesn't work very well stab that works pretty well so it's like etching things on his armor like like notes because he does that he like puts notes on his armor for like future study and he like assorts a band of like crew surfs, ultramarines, a few ab humans, and he goes, take a weapon off the wall, take one of it's fine. He doesn't need him right now. Take one of Gilliman's like personal weapons. He's We're gonna a, go like fight to the bridge. He's in the he vacuum saves, of space right now. <laughs> he doesn't need yeah, it. Yeah. He doesn't need it right now. And like he goes to the bridge where Marius Gage, who's like the chap the first chapter master and indeed the first chapter master of the Ultramarines chapter, is like gonna be killed by a demon. Then Feel comes in, kills all the demons, like, all right, guys, and it's like, all right, what's going on? And Mary's like, who put you in charge? He's like, I did, because everything's gone tits up. And it's like, uh, and he was there when um, uh, Rabute got his neck cut by Fulgrim, and he saved him and took him, he teleported him back to the, the ship they were using and escaped. So Feel is kind of a smaller character in some ways, but by the end of his story, he becomes captain of, I think, the second company. And we never see him after Rabute gets uh, put in a uh, stasis coffin. But he's just a nice little kind of fun, considering how stringent the Ultramarines are with rules and everything, he's a nice little, oh, little he, 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 he's cat. unconventional. Yeah, bit of contrast. And because of his service, that's why Ultramarine sergeants wear red helmets. I was of, about to say, yeah. The ones, oh, yeah. Cool. Well, you brought it up, it was like, he's the guy, he's the reason they're red. He's the guy. Helmets. Also, pretty cool. fun fact about coloration, the, uh, the yellow, the golden trim, only the second company. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the rest of the Ultramarine companies have completely different colors. That being yeah. said, you will never find someone who does not have their Ultramarine's army painted blue and gold. Apart from Uriel Ventress, who has green. I yeah, so. you'll have green through me off. If anyone who has like a Uriel Ventress mini or something like that, whether it be homebrewed or I don't, is there? An, I don't think there's an official one. Oh, there's an official one. He got. He's um. He crossed the Rubicon Primaris. Mm. And he has six books now officially on the yeah, he, he has a whole like video with him of like showing off the model. He's like, I am Uriel Ventress, and it's got a cool like oh, yeah. animated Some, thing, uh, and it's like, model. look at his model, it's quite cool. Say so, so pardon me. Uh so you'll have the blue and gold, and then if you're running Uriel Ventress, you'll have one guy with green trim. 
<laughs> oh, this is the nitpick here. He also has he has square shoes, like square boots. All right, I don't. No know. other model has like all, all the space marines have like rounded feet. His are square, and it's I'm I don't know why that is. Thanks for pointing why that is he, out. <laughs> why I is he the only uh, space marine that has now square Now I can't unsee it. I don't know. It's so bizarre, but it's cool. But it's bizarre. It's like cool, but yes, yeah, now I can't I, unsee that. It is I, your Ventress. Ventress. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway. Uh, uh, square foot looking ass. <laughs> before, we oh. before we wrap up, there is one thing I would like to posit. Uh, Matt Ward, you know, very obviously shows his favoritism and all that about the Ultramarines. I think Warhammer would be a better setting if more people in the authors showed favoritism towards their favorite army like Matt Ward did. Oh, Iron Hands, I, I White want, Scars, yeah, Salamanders, I, bruh, we are dying over here. I want to go from a book reading about the Ultramarines fighting 10 billion Tyranids with 10 men and winning to a mm. book about an Eldar craft world fighting 11D Space Marine chapters and 10 <laughs> gazillion guardsmen and winning to then a book about the Imperial Guard just demolishing demon world after demon world. If everyone the white scars having a race with that or clan who love really yeah, fast bikes, to, to, to the white <laughs> scars really being remembered. <laughs> uh, uh, I think if everyone if everyone wrote like Matt Ward, everyone would be overpowered and no one would be overpowered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that being said, are there any questions about the Ultramarines? I can answer. Just a statement of um, if you talk they about Dagon, awesome. I, I was I wasn't I wasn't I swear <laughs> I didn't think about it. I thought we should probably say it. <laughs> I was gonna say it's just a statement of how if someone again if they're kind of new to Warhammer, you, you'll see it on all the box art. They're like, they, don't think of them as the white bread. They actually do have a good amount of depth to them, and they are pretty. I said they're pretty cool. They are pretty cool. And so, you know, give, don't give them a chance. Pressure to not collect them just because people don't like the Ultramarines. It's like, if you think they're cool, it's fine. Like, they don't go, go ham. Yeah. And as uh, someone who's painted a couple Ultramarine Space Marine minis, I have to vouch for them. If you just want to get into tabletop and start painting, there's worth ar worse armies to paint than them. Mm -hmm. uh, very easy, very striking, recognizable color scheme. And of course, they have a Primark on the Loyalist side, which automatically, at least for now, in terms of tabletop and all that, puts them above the rest. Very definitely, true. definitely. Uh, that being said, uh, is there anything else to cover, or do you think that's uh, that's our ultramarines? That was, uh, I believe, our ultramarines overview. Like I said at the beginning, this was not nearly everything because they are the poster boys of the poster boy faction. There is a lot of ultramarines. There are books about Cato Sicarius and you know Calgar them fighting the they're not Tyrians, the Necrons. There's books about them fighting, you know, the Demaculaba, Chaos. There's all the Horus Heresy mm. books. There is Ventress a... alone has like seven books or something yeah. crazy. Six there... or seven now, it's insane. There is a lot of Ultramarine. Like uh, certain characters like might have more books in them. Like I think Caiaphas Cain has more uh, Gaunt, uh, Gotrick and Felix. So there's more books than like individual Ultramarines characters. But the chapter as a whole, there is a lot. So... There is, if you are interested, if you uh, enjoyed and you thought that, dang, these, uh, these Ultramarines seem like cool people, actually, you are not starved for content at all. There is a lot <laughs> about them. The models are good, too, as well. I yeah. have to say, the models are yes, they're very cool. pretty good. Uh, that being said, uh, next time we will be covering the second edition of our Primarchs. So this will be Primarchs uh, 11 to 20. So a lot more traitors, I will say. They'll be fun. Yep. And, and indeed, okay. covering Gilliman himself. Ooh. More, more ultramarines. More, more ultramarines. More. 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 That being so said, eating the anchovies. More. <laughs> more. I was thinking of Adam Driver in the new Star yeah, Wars races. Too, more. Man. More. Shoot, Luke. <laughs> Phantom Luke. Uh, that being said, though. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please like and subscribe. Really helps us out. Helps us make more of these and make terrible jokes about the mongrel dogs of the empire. <laughs> <laughs> I was editing that. It's going to have to put 
<laughs> it's me. Uh, it's me. I'm gonna have to edit uh, so many yeah. Dagoth errors into this video. <laughs> I've so, so many sorry. jabs at the lack of films you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Colin has to listen to this again. Uh, as I said, um, yep. Yeah, so please, uh, yeah, like and subscribe really helps us out. And we we'll see you all next time when we uh, do the second half of the Primarchs. You know the the chatty chatty daddies. <laughs> Put it there. Oh, I know. Ugh. And uh, that being said, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Take care, everyone, guys. Raw Dog, your local Eldar. Love you. Uh.